All right, welcome everyone to the 2022 Tilden Fungus Fair. I'm your host, Trent Pierce, and I'm a naturalist with East Bay Regional Parks in California's Bay Area. I'm broadcasting live today from Tilden Nature Area in Berkeley, California. Uh, before we continue, I wanna hear from you. I'd like to know where you're joining us from today. If you're watching live on YouTube or Facebook, go ahead and let me know in the comments where you're watching from. See if this comment section thing actually works. All right, Berkeley. Hello, neighbor. Kensington, Berkeley. Hey, everyone. San Francisco. Hello, almost neighbor. Ooh, Concord. Hello, slightly more distant neighbor. Walnut Creek. Thanks for joining today. Awesome. Boise, Idaho. Wow. Did I say it right? It's Boise, right? Russia. Awesome. I think we have a winner as the uh, as for the farthest farthest uh, away participant. Oakland, Rockport. Coastal blizzard in progress. I'm sorry, Jan. That sounds cold. I won't tell you the temperature here. It's pretty warm. Hi, Dr. Monica. Thanks for joining. Boise, I got it right. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for sharing, everyone, and thanks so much for joining. Uh, I have to say, you know, up until about three weeks ago, we were planning on having this event in person, which was going to involve having a couple thousand people in our very small visitor center and auditorium. And, you know, um, it seemed like the right move to to take it virtually again another year. Um, I did it virtually last year for the first time and it was pretty fun. I was a little worried this year that people would kind of be tired of watching things on the internet. So thanks for joining. Uh, definitely hope to have it in person and virtually next year. So keep your fingers crossed and stay tuned. Uh, before we go any further, I'm going to give everyone a brief outline of the weekend. So our schedule for the day, 1110, or maybe a little after, depending on how long I talk, we're going to hear from Christian Schwarz, uh, data is not the destination. Then at 12 o'clock, we're going to go over the results of the iNaturalist Bay Area Myco Blitz. At 1230, we're going to do a mushroom field guide roundup with Dr. Gordon Walker, fascinated by fungi. And then at one o'clock, we're going to hear from Dr. Monica Fisher. She's going to tell us how fungi survive and thrive after fire and we'll shut things down around two or you know maybe a little bit after that so that's an outline for the day and don't forget we're doing the same thing again tomorrow same time same place uh, we'll have a host of different presenters then so stay tuned join us again tomorrow Well, I see our first speaker is queued up in the virtual green room, so it's my pleasure to announce him. Christian Schwarz is a well-known naturalist and mycologist hailing from Santa Cruz, California. He studied ecology and evolution at UC Santa Cruz and now spends his time photographing, teaching about, collecting, and researching macro fungi. He's co-author of the seminal Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, which we'll talk about later in the field guide review. Fungi satisfy his curiosity with their seemingly endless forms from the grotesque to the bizarre to the sublimely beautiful. He's passionate about biodiversity-centered community science, especially iNaturalist, and he is currently a research associate for the Norris Center for Natural History, as well as the Santa Barbara Botanical Gardens. Thanks for joining us, Christian. Howdy. Um, how many years have you been coming to the Tilden Fungus Fair now? I don't remember. I guess was it before Mushrooms of Redwood Coast came out? Did I come before then? I think you might have. Yeah. So then that's at least six years now, maybe more. How well, long has the Tilden Fungus Fest been going? This is the sixth annual Tilden oh, so Fungus maybe Fest. So you were you were probably at the very first one. Yeah, you're an OG. 
Um, well, thanks again for, for joining us virtually. I know it's not quite as fun as being in person, but um, you know, well. here, here we are, we're, we're making do. Um, and you're still in Santa Cruz, right? Is that where That's you're right. broadcasting from? Yep. Gotta love Santa Cruz. How, how are the mushrooms in Santa Cruz? It's looking like an like a, a an early end to the season, maybe. It's mm. January. We should be swimming in mushrooms, but we're decidedly not. Um, that's okay. I mean, the early early part of the season did have a pretty big takeoff, so we had some early mushrooms that most years we don't get to count on. Every year is what it is, I suppose. Yeah, we're kind of kind of making do with our uh, our new new uh, winter weather regime, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, folks, I'm going to turn it over to Christian. Here's Christian Schwarz with Data is Not the Destination, Culture and, and Spirit in Community Science. I hope you'll all bear with me if there's a little bit of, of rocky takeoff on getting this presentation queued up. Um, I think I can do this. Trent had me practice a couple days ago, but I'm, I'm not um, as practiced at it as I wish I was. I'm going to rely on Trent telling me that everything looks good. Can everyone see the screen? Not Christian, it looks, it looks great. Okay, then we're off to the races. Here we go. Um, the talk I'm giving today is admittedly a little bit philosophical. It's less directly about organisms. It's less directly about science. Um, I think we'll get the pictures as we go through it, and it may, might not be the kind of talk you're used to getting at a fungus fair. Um, but I hope that you'll find something that resonates with you in this in this talk. All right, so for starters, we're all here because of mushrooms, right? The fungus fair uh, at Tilden. Um, maybe you've come to the fungus fair in Santa Cruz. This is the community that I'm mostly in. People who like mushrooms, people who like fungi. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I personally am attracted to them to begin with. Um, Trent read that silly little bio that I wrote for myself. And it is silly, but it does highlight something that is true, which is that my curiosity is interested in satisfied with fun that endlessly. There's no question that I can ask that I can easily answer when I ask it about fungi. And that actually is why I've stuck with this group of organisms for so long. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that first, and then I'm going to tell you about where my attraction to these organisms has led me um, over the decade that I've started to move beyond just learning about them for myself, but also teaching people about them, and the challenges that I've come to face about why we do what we do. Um, okay, so for starters, we all know that mushrooms like this, this polypore, are decomposers. They're critical to the ecological functioning of the global biosphere. So if it wasn't for the ac action of these decomposer fungi, wood would stay wood forever. It would never sort of fall apart and re-release its carbon to the global ecosystem. Plants wouldn't be able to absorb new carbon dioxide and make new bodies every year. Um, so they play a critical ecological role. There's no denying that. But they're also parasites. They also control ecosystems from the other side of things by preventing the growth of certain kinds of organisms by killing them outright, causing disease, uh, creating less dense populations of certain kinds of organisms that might otherwise become dominant uh, in a forest habitat. And we all know about mycorrhizal fungi, mutualists that form these reciprocally beneficial symbioses with mostly woody plants are the ones we're familiar with, but there are mycorrhizal fungi that partner with little annual wildflowers and shrubs as well. Um, so you have three different basic ecologies, mutualists, decomposers, and parasites that together uh, constitute sort of the critical roles that fungi play in global ecosystems. And if you're just interested in a functioning biosphere, you have to understand how fungi play into that. So that is undoubtedly one of the, the main ways that fungi interest me is what roles do they play as ecological actors? Um, but that's not the only only way that I'm interested in fungi, the only modality of my interest. Uh, I'm also fascinated by the fact that fungi span across scales of time and space in a way that very few other groups of organisms do. For example, the mushroom you see on your screen right now, it's even kind of hard to recognize it as a mushroom because it's so gossamer. It's so 
tiny. This is uh, a little inky cap that's much, much smaller than my pinky finger growing on a single pellet of elk dung. It's a decomposer, but it, as a fruit body, lasts only a few hours, um, very short-lived. So low on the temporal persistence part of the time scale. And there are fungi that are even smaller and even more short-lived. For example, if you're a baker or a brewer, you know these tiny little single-celled yeasts that ferment the sugars in, in flour or in um, your malt. These are organisms that are so small, they're, they're strictly microscopic and they last, their lifespan is only a few hours or, or maybe a day. This is the small and short-lived end of the spectrum. But we all know that fungi go all the way up to the other end of the temporal and spatial scale. Some of the largest and oldest living creatures on the planet are mushrooms. These are honey mushrooms. Some of you have probably seen these in the woods. Uh, there are two individuals of honey mushrooms that are sort of vying for the title of largest terrestrial organism. Uh, one in Michigan, one in Oregon. Many of you have heard of the story of these humongous fungus uh, mycelia that span square acres, many tens of square acres, and are potentially on the order of millennia old, thousands of years old, individuals that have been spreading contiguously outwards through the forest that they live in. It's hard to find examples of plants that are both single-celled microscopic and on the other end of their of the, the kingdom are among the largest and oldest living organisms. Fungi anchor out both ends of that spectrum in a way that you don't really find in the animal kingdom or, or amongst plants. Um, there are examples of both, but not both simultaneously within the same kingdom in the same way that, that we find in fungi. So this also fascinates me about them. They seem to be extremely broad um, in the ways that they inhabit space and time. They also do things that seem kind of impossible or counterintuitive or against the first impressions of mushrooms that a lot of people hold. For example, here's from uh, a recently published paper about this uh, mushroom that lives in the salt flats of the high desert in South America. All that white stuff you see in the foreground is crusty chunks of salt at the edges of these wetland systems high in the mountains. There's snow in the background there. Um, and all those little orange dots you see in the foreground are mushrooms growing directly out of the salt crust. And every time I seemingly find out about some example like this, you know, multiple times a year, of a, a mushroom or a fungus just doing something almost unbelievable, um, totally different from how people think of as mushrooms inhabiting dark, cool, wet forests or basements. Um, there are some of them that live in very dry, salty, hot, bright places as well. And I like that they seem to consistently challenge my expectations of them. And when you broaden your, your view of what this habitat looks like and realize that this is also the place where the water turns pink because it's full of brine shrimp and flamingos come and filter out all of those little crustaceans, and that there's a crust of white salt around the edge of this wetland with orange mushrooms growing out of it and snow on the high peaks above it. It's just so beautiful and so strange that it makes me want to, I hope maybe my ashes will be scattered in a place like this, somewhere where something totally foreign and totally beautiful can be happening. Um, likewise, mushrooms live down in the deep ocean. We don't know what they're doing there necessarily. Our understanding of their ecologies in these habitats is very poor, but no matter where you are on the planet, um, and I do mean not just the terrestrial planet, but down in the deep ocean, up in the high stratosphere, there are representatives of fungi there, whether they're single spores or actual organisms. They're all over the layer cake of our, our planet. So this all fascinates me about fungi. They're in our brains as well. They're on our bodies. They're essential parts of our gut biota. Um, if you want to understand the human ecosystem, which has impacts on your mood, and your functioning. You have to understand the ecology of critters that live on and in you. Um, these are all the reasons that I keep coming back to fungi as my sort of core group, the group of organisms on earth that I'm most connected to and most interested in uh, understanding in the long run. But I'm not only interested in fungi. The more that I've spent time trying to understand these organisms, the more I've realized that I can't understand them atomically. I can't understand them without reference to the context they're situated in. Um, the flamingos there were just one example. What is the interaction that you could draw? How many degrees of separation is there between a flamingo and the bright orange like an Omphalia that lives right next to it? Um, what interactions do they have with each other? What consequences do their lives have for one another? 
and so the more I've studied mushrooms, the more I've realized I need to study everything. And it's not a burden, it's actually a delight. Um, and there's just a million questions that we don't have any insight into really, or not any insight, but very little understanding of. We don't have any sort of fine-grained estimate of how much fungal diversity there is on the planet. If you look at currently published estimates, they range wildly all over the map, hundreds of thousands up to 5 million. Um, there's very little consensus about what scale of diversity we're dealing with. Uh, how to recognize them. Well, there's a missing word there. We don't know how to even put names to the actors in this ecological play um, that's unfolding all around us and that we call the living world. So we don't know how to, to identify, to recognize, to name mushrooms, which is sort of a critical step, even though it seems kind of trivial. Um, it's a critical step in starting to be able to tell ecological stories to, to ourselves and to one another. We don't know much about their distributions. If you look for fungal range maps, where do individual species live, we don't, we don't have good maps of those, uh, of those ranges. And it's one of my favorite things to think about is fungal biogeography. Why do different species live in the places they live and why don't they live in places where we don't find them? Um, all of those things are changing, of course. Uh, the planet is changing. Climate change is expected to have impacts not only for the diversity of fungi that are around us, mostly negative, um, but it's also going to change where organisms disperse around the globe. All of these questions, of course, fascinate me and keep me uh, in this community of people studying fungi. We don't know about their seasonality. Um, we know that there is such a thing as mushroom season. It's hard to find mushrooms in the summer. And formerly, it was much easier to find mushrooms in January, uh, the winter on the California coast. But even that is changing um, in some ways more rapidly and more dramatically than any of these other factors I'm talking about. The phenology is what we call it in science. The, the seasonality of organismal events is changing rapidly. And even if it's sometimes disturbing or unsettling or astonishing how quickly it's changing, it is a fascinating realm of questions to think about. Um, if you're interested in conservation, you can start to ask questions about whether or not fungal populations are increasing or decreasing, if there are invasive fungi or uh, non-native fungi arriving in California, where are they taking hold? Are they having consequences for the diversity of native fungi? All of these are open questions that we are at the beginning of starting to understand and pursue answering. Um, the way I've done this, of course, is to focus on my home county in Santa Cruz and to use iNaturalist to document what I'm seeing and be able to talk to other people about the experiences I'm having of the living world. This is what a map of my observations of living things looks like in Santa Cruz. You can see the places that I go a lot and the places I rarely go. But this by itself is not interesting, um, at least to me. Looking at one person's experience of the world is already what I had access to. I know what I've seen. I could write it down in a notebook. Why is it that iNaturalist helps me do anything different or new that I wasn't able to do before? Well. The point of iNaturalist as a community science platform is it allows you to share what you're seeing with other people and to see what other people are sharing with you. So when you start to pool people's observations together, you get a much bigger, broader, more interconnected picture of what any individual observation means. Um, these are even old statistics now. I forget when I took this screenshot, probably a year or two ago. Um, there are now more than 50,000 observations of macro fungi in Santa Cruz County. Um, certainly more than 2,000 observers have now contributed to our understanding of what the mushrooms, uh, who they are, how many there are, what they're doing in our county. Um, and this is where the real value of iNaturalist comes in, is by connecting people's observations one to the other and connecting the people themselves one to the other. And that's what most of the rest of this talk is going to be about. What is the point of doing these kind of community science projects. What is community science? Why do I call it community science now when just a few years ago, I was calling it citizen science? That change was slow to take hold in me. Um, I wasn't sure why I needed to update my vocabulary. And for a while I didn't, but now I have, and there's some pretty specific reasons why I have. Um, Trent started this project. Ranger Trent, who just introduced me. Um, this is the state level version of what I'm doing at the county level. Once again, old stats. These numbers are much higher now. I think we're closing in on a half million observations of 
macro fungi just in the California floristic province. So that is a level of sharing, a level of communication, a level of observation of the non-human living world around us that could hardly be dreamed of by ecologists or academics even five or 10 years ago. Something new is happening in our ability to talk to one another as people about the non-people, the living things that surround us. What does this all mean? Where does it go? Where does it lead us? Where, where, where trends all this madness? Um, well, first of all, it leads us to a huge amount of data that we're dealing with. There is just a lot of sharing going on. Since iNaturalist was introduced in 2008, it took a long time for the mushroom community to really discover it. Not until about 2014 did people really start using it. And you can see that every winter thereafter in California, there's been a huge spike of participation that shows no signs of slowing. This graph just keeps going up and up. Where does this lead us? Where does this take us? Of what value is there simply in having a lot of data? Um, it's not just mushrooms. All of iNaturalist is doing this, regardless of what species you're talking about or group of species. Um, the growth is exponential. And the question for us as a community is, what do we do now? Is there an end goal to be striving towards? And what I'm basically going to argue in, in my talk today is that there isn't an end goal, and it's certainly not the data in and of itself. We shouldn't look at these graphs and assume that we've done our job or that there even is a job to be done. Um, I'll get into that more in a second, but I started by saying the data is not the destination, and that's what I want to highlight here. Even though these graphs are impressive, even though it's amazing to see how much sharing we're doing, um, it's not the goal in and of itself to simply generate a lot of data. Uh, data is not going to get us out of any of the problems that we face as a community of people interested in biodiversity. Um, and in fact, one could argue that it's part of the problem to simply be uh, documenting with a tech-mediated, screen-mediated interface um, between us and these organisms. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? What is the point of community science? And why, once again, am I calling it community science? Um, I'm going to leave you with this little anecdote about the really cool value of community science before I move on into the arguments I'm going to be presenting about, about what we're doing here. So this just is something that came up in 2019 that to me really drove home how effective this platform is in getting allowing us to know our neighbors in real time. Uh, my friend Ryan was up in Alaska. He's a birder. He is not a, a mushroom expert by any means, um, but he was out on a hike and taking pictures of all the mushrooms he saw and sending me photos sort of in real time of what he was seeing. And most of them were common mushrooms, things that I'd seen I knew lived in Alaska. But eventually I scrolled through his photos and saw this picture and realized that he'd found something extremely special something that I've always wanted to see and something that very few humans on the planet have ever seen. Um, these little tiny, they're only about as big as the end of your thumb, scaly purplish mushrooms that smell like grape soda and that are parasites on other mushrooms. And I immediately recognized this as a squamanita. This is a, a genus of mushrooms that very few people have ever seen. And I asked him to go back on the trail to take that hike again and to collect a few fruit bodies and send them to me. And he did, he dried them out on his dashboard of his rental car flew back to Los Angeles from LA, sent me the specimens. I was able to get uh, a DNA sequence from them and confirm that they were in fact the species Squamanita fimbriata, which had only been found twice ever, ever in the history of the world by anyone who knowingly uh, recognized what they were. Both of those times were in Europe. So this was the first record for the Western hemisphere and only the third time anyone, any human had ever knowingly seen the species as far as we have records for. Um, which to me really drove drove home the, the potential that lies in the platform that iNaturalist is. It is a sharing tool, first and foremost, because it allows you to communicate in more or less real time with everyone who cares to be looking um, globally. This means it can connect experts to non-experts, rank amateurs, people who have no idea what they're looking at people who are new to the world of nature. Maybe it's their first hike ever. Um, believe it or not, there are still students of mine at the college level who've never been hiking, period. And 
they're interested in using iNaturalist from the start. So they can start getting feedback from people who are experts in these organisms on day one, on their first, very first venture into nature. And that's extraordinarily valuable. But what is it valuable for? Where does it take us? Um, what this shows us, or what this showed me, this example, but also all of the rest of the experiences that I've had with iNaturalist and all of the sort of statistics I've shown about its growth have shown that people who are non-experts can observe, record, and share at any scale you really care to scale up to. Um, they can do it frequently. They, do, they can do it in real time, and they can do it persistently, year after year, over the entire globe. The growth of iNaturalist in, in countries outside the US is increasing rapidly. It seems that every year a new country discovers iNaturalist and a community blooms around it, which is great. Um, but once again, I'm led to what is the point of all this? Where does it take us? Uh, is community science really science? If so, how does it fit into the existing scientific paradigm? And if it doesn't, um, where does that leave us? One way of answering this question is what can academics do with the data that's being produced there? Well, there's certainly a lot to be done. I will argue that this is a new kind of data. What we're getting is very fine grained temporally and spatially. So we get very detailed maps in both time and space of where living things are and what living things are doing, which allows us to ask new kinds of questions. If you get new kinds of data, you can ask new kinds of questions. Um, and it allows academics to enfranchise a broader section of the community. So it, the ivory tower is this sort of persistent problem in how we do science and how we do academia in this country and probably globally. But the ivory tower is the idea that knowledge is cloistered. It's sort of sequestered into a very small segment of the population that remains separate from the rest of us, the broader population. And something that community science promises to help uh, do is to, well, maybe it doesn't promise, but the potential is certainly there, is to make that distinction blurrier and to let everyone have some way of contributing to knowledge building, knowledge creation that we call science. So I think all of this is latent in the potential of community science. That's there. We can do this if we want to. But there are other reasons that I've started to say community science instead of citizen science. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. This is the Mima Meadow. Um, it's a beautiful meadow on the west side of the UC Santa Cruz campus, uh, right across the street from the main part of the campus. And I've been visiting it ever since I started going to school here. And I've fallen in love with it in various ways. Um, aesthetically, I've had experiences in this meadow that are both tied to people as well as to the organisms that live there that make it a special place in my heart and in my mind. And there's a couple ways of visualizing it. I can go see what's represented uh, about the Mima Meadow on iNaturalist. And as you can tell, people document it uh, extensively. People visit the Mima Meadow and they take pictures of what they find there, all the living organisms, and you can go explore that. But this is not what makes me excited about the Mima Meadow. This is not what I look forward to seeing. I don't really have an emotional attachment to the number of species that have been seen there or the number of observations that have been made there. And I'm not particularly looking forward to do any science about the Mima Meadow. That's not the point of my attachment to the Mima Meadow and its organism. Um, really what attaches me to the Mima Meadow is this sort of almost hallucinatory sense I have of anticipation of seeing the organisms that live there in all their beauty. So this is a little sort of collage of organisms that I tried to put together out of photos I'd taken there of all the organisms or some of the organisms I think about when I think about the meadow. The snakes, the wildflowers, um, the mariposa lilies, the, uh, the white-tailed kites, the red-tailed hawks flying over, the tiger beetles, these little iridescent green beetles that live on the trail edges there. It's the aesthetic attachment that I have to the Mima Meadow that keeps me going back there. and. I use iNaturalist to document and share this, not because I care whether or not any science ever comes out of it. I don't really care whether the data points I generate are perceived as data for any future um, analysis. That's not the point. And the more I taught people about biodiversity and the more I taught people about community science, 
um, here at the university or in the private sort of uh, nature centers that I go and give lectures or workshops for, I realized that I wasn't being totally honest. I kept saying science as if that was the main point or the main reason to use a community science platform like iNaturalist. And that wasn't true to my, my own priorities. That's not why I use it. The reason I use it is to communicate aesthetic beauty that I'm experiencing with other people who care about that, that kind of thing, who love how beautiful these organisms are, who find a sense of peace and tranquility in simply being there, um, being in wild habitats, being amongst non-human creatures. And that got me thinking about this term, citizen science. What is the point of involving the concept of citizenry in science? And I'm not the first person to say this, and I certainly won't be the last, but that term citizen seemed to uh, imply that you had to be a, a citizen of, of something, of some kind, um, perhaps of the state that you live in or the country that you happen to be born in. And that could be about the farthest thing from my priorities as I could imagine. I don't care if you're a citizen here or a citizen anywhere. I want you to be part of this process that we're doing, uh, no matter who you are. Um, and by changing my vocabulary from citizen science to community science, it was actually much more accurate about what my priorities were. Community is the goal for me, regardless of whether or not science ever happens. That doesn't mean I don't care about science that's been done with this data. Obviously, I do it so much that it has to be one of my priorities. I do science with the data that's generated on our naturalist, but I don't care for it to be the only motivating priority or motivating principle that is found in this group of people and in this platform. I care at least half as much, maybe more, about the community of people meeting each other and having a shared experience regardless of whether or not we ever analyze it or ever use it to make conservation decisions. All of these sort of backfilled rationalizations that we often present to each other about what we're doing there. Part of this is because that's what I see when I take students out into the woods. Um, that's part of why I've reached this conclusion. I don't see, like the guy you see on your screen now, my student Dan, taking a picture of those waxy caps because he sees them as a, a data point. I don't think Dan sees them as um, a little bit of statistical power for some future analysis that an academic will do. I think he thinks they're beautiful and wants to take a picture and share that picture with other people. Um, likewise, Barbara, um, or my student Julian on the right here, looking at the bottom of this giant California nutmeg tree, I don't think they're experiencing in any of these moments a sense that quantifying and analyzing these organisms is what their goal is. They're maybe documenting them with the knowledge that that data point may represent um, an interesting bit of quantitative power for some future academic to use, but Primarily our goal here is to meet the organisms on their own term and to meet other people who like these organisms, who find the same sort of aesthetic delight in them that we do. And there's consequences of developing this community or sort of a value in the community that I wanna talk about next. So the reason community science is so attractive to me is that it has lowered the barrier to entry for knowledge creation. You don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be an academic. You don't ever have to increase your own skill set in order to provide um, little handles to increasing our knowledge of the living things on the planet. Anyone who can sort of work with the basic tools of iNaturalist um, can create some sort of contribution to our understanding. So this is about as low as the barrier can come. They've really invested in making this tool and this platform easy to use. And that's attractive to me. It, enfranchises or it broadens the scope of people who can be involved uh, much more broadly than it has ever been sort of the, the case before. Um, I think it, prior, it doesn't prioritize or explicitly incentivize play, but that's the result. People seem to uh, take this tool and play with it. Uh, there is no goal-directed behavior um, for a lot of the users. I think it's simply what attracts us about the world becomes legitimized as something worth sharing with other people. Um, and we're given the tools to simply play and tell about it, which results in accidental knowledge creation. I think this is what I like 
so much about community science, uh, at least in the sort of model that iNaturalist has arrived at, is that we end up getting all of this data without telling anyone what to do. There's no sort of protocol being followed. There's no list of requirements uh, that you have to check off before you are allowed to share your experience. Anything you care to pay attention to and take the time to document is fair play, fair game. Everyone can look at it. Uh, you can talk about it as an interesting nubbin of the universe that you have focused on and, and find fascinating. And the summary of all that, or I guess to reveal the punchline, is that I don't think there is a destination to what community science is doing. It's not about an end goal to be pursued. And perhaps this was obvious to a lot of people, um, and I'm late to the game here, but I at least want to admit um, publicly that I don't think there is an end goal that we're working towards in community science. I think it's the practice of community science that is is the valuable thing that we're doing. Every observation that we make is sort of like a little prayer or a little affirmation that the living world around us is valuable. It's interesting and it is worthy of our attention. The reason that I see people using uh, these community science platforms is because of their own aesthetic delight, their fascination with the organisms that surround us and the sense of wonder that they get when they engage with it deeply. Um, that is something that I think is different between my pre-I naturalist use and my post-I naturalist use is that I engage more deeply because I naturalist has allowed me to connect with people who focus on organisms that I didn't previously pay much attention to. So seeing other people mirror my interest or respond to my occasional documentation of something like a millipede or a springtail that I might've ignored in prior years seems to become legitimized, or I can attach it to someone else's experience in a way that makes me more likely to do it again, makes me more likely to lend my attention to those organisms that otherwise uh, I previously might not even have, might not have entered my awareness. They might have been below my scale of attention or above my scale of attention. Um, there are ways of visualizing data on iNaturalist that allow me to think about the big picture that's above my scale as a human being. Um, I think the, the point that I'm making about iNaturalist here is that it allows you to push outside your pre-existing biases in your sensory sort of boundaries to go smaller than you had ever gone before, paying attention to tiny little organisms living under logs, as well as to think about larger scale patterns in real time than you could ever sort of visualize or grasp um, until you were able to see the pool of observations made by people who came before you and to compare them to the people who will come after. So it's a way of broadening your, your sensory scale. Um, someone who's a great illustration of this is Alison Pollock. Um, many of you have probably met Alison or seen her photos um, published online or even National Geographic most recently, I think. Alison um, got interested in slime mold. I don't know exactly when, but it feels recent. But she's absolutely taken the community by storm. Um, she's perfected. Alison probably argues she hasn't even perfected it yet, but for my purposes, she's perfected the techniques of focusing our attention down to a scale of, of smallness that we previously didn't have much access to. And she's sort of taking these tiny organisms and making them feel like they're somehow on our scale. And it just has increased the level of attention uh, that the community pays to slime molds, the mycobacteria, the springtails, the tiny fungi in a way that we certainly didn't have, I think, 20 or 30 years ago. There were certainly people who cared about those organisms back then, but not to the degree that we're seeing um, in the current moment. I think people are moved in a way by the work of people like Allison in a way that we haven't seen before. And that gives me a lot of hope that somehow we are able to lend value to these organisms in a way that was harder to do, harder to find um, in previous generations. And what I like about Allison's example is that it, it's not necessarily motivated by her taxonomic or scientific goals. There's no, um, I think Allison will be the first to tell you that she's not primarily a taxonomist. Um, she simply loves paying attention to the aesthetic beauty of these organisms. And when you enfranchise a large enough group of people, you get the benefit of all of their 
neural diversity. Everyone's uh, sensory biases, everyone's sensory priorities are a little bit different. And when you get to see the products um, of a large community of people sharing what they're sensing, you get a very rich picture of the world around you. So your particular set of attention, what you care about, what you think is interesting is going to be different from the person next to you. And that that difference, your particular version of how to spend your attention is really a gift, um, not only to you, it's a way of expressing your individuality, but to the rest of the people you can share with. I love seeing people pay attention to organisms that I would miss, that I would never think to pay attention to. And every time I see someone whose attention is clearly different from mine, it gives me hope. I'm not even sure why, but there's something about it that makes me feel good about the world, realizing that this difference exists, that there is an inherent diversity of people's um, aesthetic priorities. And we can get this, I mean, there are many people who have used iNaturalist who have now passed away. So we are receiving um, or still able to engage with the documentation of people who are no longer with us. And that always feels like a, a particularly intimate and beautiful way of connecting with prior generations. And this is only gonna get more common the longer iNaturalist is a platform. I mean, imagine a hundred years down the road, being able to look back at the observations that your grandparents made, even after they passed away and say, oh, look at that hike that my grandpa took on Tuesday, the 15th of November, um, 2000, whenever, and imagining the experiences he had on that day, imagining the engagement he had with the flower on that day in his life. That's something I sort of look forward to, being able to look back on the uh, little discrete bits of documentation that past naturalists are leaving for us, almost like a, a gift to the future. This is, of course, nothing new. If you've spent enough time in poetry, in the humanities, you know that there are people who've been saying this for a long time. Mary Oliver um, was always a poet. I was um, attracted to, but recently I realized that she is basically a poet of community science. There are breadcrumbs, there are instructions that she's left for us that basically enumerate what community science is. All you have to do to be a member of this community is to pay attention, be astonished, have some sort of aesthetic or emotional reaction to it, and then share it. So if you do these three things, you're basically doing community science. You are giving some of your attention to the non-human world around you. You are declaring it valuable, declaring it beautiful, declaring it interesting, and you're sharing that value with other people. I don't know how to overstate, I don't think it's possible to overstate how important I think that is, because I, I don't think it's granted that your fellow humans will necessarily give non-human organisms the same value that you do. Um, I'm assuming that I'm talking to a community of people for whom this goes without saying, that non-human organisms deserve uh, a chance to live their lives, a chance to continue to exist on this planet despite our best uh, efforts to insist on our own lives at their expense. So this is a way of providing an antidote to an otherwise very human-centric culture that I think is unfortunately um, taking hold. It's, it's really been ascendant for many, many generations. But if we don't sort of provide these antidotes, it's certainly not going to get any better. Um, I want to walk you through a few organisms just that illustrate how they take my breath away when I see things like this. This is uh, in the coast redwoods. You can see these waxy caps are extremely diverse um, in the cypresses and the redwoods and the red cedar if you go further north. These organisms are unbelievably beautiful to me. I don't know how to express it, um, but I think that when I direct people's attention to them, they share similar aesthetic reactions um, to the ones that I experience. Lime greens, bright pinks, whites, blues, purples abound. When I first ran into this moth in Borneo, I, I couldn't actually believe what I was seeing. I felt that there was some reflection of a deeper secret about the aesthetic value of the universe that was sort of crystallized in this moth. How could it be possible that an organism like this casually landed on my shoulder um, while I was walking through the rainforest there? It didn't seem possible that something so beautiful could just be um, casually present in front of me. 
it demanded of me that I value it, that I advocate for its continued existence. Um, if you go to the tide pools, there's some good low tides this weekend, and I encourage you to do this and seek out these nudibranchs, these little tiny shellless mollusks that crawl around in the algae and the hydroids. They're, I think, a common source of people's first attachment to tide pools. When you see these organisms, they rope you in with their beauty and with their seeming strangeness. Um, they don't feel like any organism you've ever seen before. They feel beautifully alien in a way. Um, Many people are astonished by the fact that birds fly and the range of colors, sounds, um, plumage textures that you can see in birds. This is a broadbill also from uh, Borneo. Here's a fish that I saw in, in southern Baja. Um, when you see these fish, when you see these organisms, there's something about their beauty, even the ones that aren't sort of traditionally beautiful, the smaller, the more esoteric. Um, the harvestmen, the slugs, the snakes that I think culturally we tend to react negatively to, at least from the mainstream perspective, um, the more you pay attention to them, the more you are attached to them and the more you realize that you have some obligation to prevent your fellow humans from driving them to extinction. And this is, of course, a terrible time um, to be a naturalist in some ways. It's really a wonderful time to be a naturalist in the sense that platforms like iNaturalist exist, but it's also a very painful time to be attuned to, sensitive to, and attached to the natural world. Um, some of you have heard this term, the Anthropocene. This is the idea that the geologic age that we're in now is defined by the biodiversity crisis, crisis precipitated by human actions. Um, and it's hard to escape. Mass extinction, defaunation is the idea that even if you don't drive an organism to extinction, you can reduce the numbers of its population so much that the world that we live in feels tangibly different. Um, and homogenization. This is another sort of uh, hallmark of the Anthropocene, is that we are moving invasive organisms around the globe that are then overrunning the habitats that we move them to, resulting in less distinction between the continents, less distinction between habitats as they all become invaded by the same set of hardy organisms um, that sort of expand beyond their natural bounds. Um, everywhere you go, you see signs of this turmoil. Predicted impacts of coral reef decline over the next 20 or 30 years are extremely dire. Bird populations have declined dramatically just in the past handful of decades. I think you've all heard about the collapse of insect and invertebrate populations, um, both in Europe and North America, where they've been studied most intensely. Uh, even with fungi, a recent paper um, published just last year or two years ago now um, by Kabir P.A. and and some of, uh, not colleagues necessarily, I don't work with them, but people I know here at UC Santa Cruz, including Clara Chin, um, have shown that we can expect this sort of collapse to come even to the fungi that we hold near and dear in North American pine-dominated forests. Everywhere you turn, it seems, leaves you with a stormy feeling inside. As a naturalist, you think the organisms I'm falling in love with are disappearing or are being drawn down in their health and their size of their populations due to human activity. And this isn't easy to bear. And it's one of the reasons I think that the community science side of community science is so important, or the community side of, of, of this endeavor is so important. Um, it's not the data that we're looking for. There's only so much quantitative analysis you can do of extinction, of population collapse. When you know it's happening, you know it's happening. You don't need to constantly assert that to yourself by tallying up the numbers again and saying, yes, it's still a crisis. Yes, we're still at risk of driving the species to extinction. You have to, at some point, stop doing math and start saying, my heart, my aesthetics, my emotional valuation of these organisms takes precedence. I no longer need quantitative rationalization in order to advocate for the protection of these habitats. Um, a friend of mine, Patty Cashian, who teaches um, at Bard College in New York, was recently on a podcast that some of you undoubtedly listened to called For the Wild. And her interview is extraordinarily lucid and makes this point in phraseology much better than I can give you today. But a point that she made that I really want to reiterate is that at some point, um, quantitative analysis of these problems is too slow 
to catch up to the problem. Your heart will get you there first. Your emotional and aesthetic valuation of organisms will tell you that it's not okay for habitats to be wiped out, for species to go extinct long before any sort of functional rationalization of why these organisms matter to human persistence um, can be tallied. Quantitative uh, analysis is certainly important, but it is not the only reason to advocate for the right of other organisms to live. Um, something that she, she mentions in, in her podcast interview is that you don't have to be apologetic about saying that love is a good enough reason to keep an organism around. And I think that is something that science is unfortunately somewhat insensitive to, especially at the academic level. Um, and I want to throw my hat or throw, throw my lot in with these people who say that you don't have to have a qualitative functional reason um, for why an organism matters to human endeavors in order to say that it deserves some right to continue on the planet. I often feel like I'm signing up for my students for front row seats at an execution when I teach them about biodiversity. I realize that I'm going to foster their engagement with organisms that are going to be in trouble in the coming decades. And I don't think it's fair to my students um, to leave them without some sort of additional tools for coping with this loss that they're going to see in their lifetimes. We're at a distinctly inflected point in human history and in natural history. Um, so the question I'm left with is how do I invest in a community of people who knows how to help each other deal with loss? I am seeking people who share my priorities, who share my aesthetic valuation of the world, and who I can commiserate with, um, who I can grieve with, who I can celebrate with. Um, because that's going to be the story of the next few decades. We're going to have to deal with some serious change um, in the natural history community and hopefully also some serious cause for celebration. Um, we're going to have to work together to hold on to the pieces of biodiversity that we can still save and hope that we make it through this, this crest of human population growth and consumption and that we can emerge on the other side of whatever narrative is playing out with quite a few of those species intact. Keep those organisms around and hope that their populations can rebound on the other side of whatever crisis we are passing through. So the reason I focus on biodiversity is that I think it's a tremendously uh, powerful nucleus for these kinds of communities. Obviously, you could find community through religion, through public service, through politics, through literature. But for me, there's something particularly strong and valuable about using non-human organisms as the center for the community that I want to be a part of. Um, and I could talk about the reasons why I think it's so strong for hours, but um, part of it is because it's so close to the source of what sustains life on earth. It is the source. Um, all these other sort of ways of achieving community seem to be more derived or more distant from, from that original foundation for, for what supports our being on this planet in the first place. And as far as feeling calm or feeling some sort of solace despite the troubles that the biosphere is facing, is that no matter what article you just read that makes you feel doom and gloom, you can still go outside and stare at the scrub day bathing in your bird bath, which is what I'm seeing out the window right now. And in that moment, sort of forget about the broader um, turmoil that you could be facing and just bathe in that beauty with that scrub day. Beauty is a balm, beauty soothes the nervous system, I think, and nature is rich with it. You can always find a little bit of solace simply by basking in what your senses bring you from the outside world. And lastly, there's some amount of gratitude and perspective that come from understanding that these cycles have been gone through before. They certainly weren't caused by humans in prior mass extinctions, but there have been prior mass extinctions on this planet, and nature has rebounded through them. Um, even if it's not the nature we would prefer, there will be an after that comes after the perturbations of human action on the ecosystem, on the biosphere. There will be an after. Um, and sometimes that perspective, even though it's a hard pill to swallow, helps me realize that even my worry about human behavior is in a way anthropocentric. Um, the universe will unfold, unravel, unfurl, long after our impact on it have ceased. So there is something to be said for 
taking that bigger picture view. And I think connecting with nature um, instills that in me repeatedly. Whales, for example, are doing much better now than their populations were doing 50 years ago. Um, this is a success story. Um, and finding these sort of small moments of nature surviving our perturbation and rebounding in the aftermath thereof is something that we can, we should probably focus on and mirror to ourselves about uh, what can survive um, sort of the worst impulses of human behavior. Gary Snyder is another poet I often turn to. And in my classes, I try and sort of embody these principles that are at the end of one of his one of his poems. Um, I how many words is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that encapsulate pretty much everything I want to do going forward. Um, I want to centralize community as one of the necessary and important outcomes of community science, whether or not science ever happens. Great if it does, and if it doesn't, community is good enough as an end goal in itself. Um, I want to learn the flowers. I want to continue getting to know my living neighbors on the planet, and I want to go light. I want to encourage the generations that come after us that we've been treading too heavily on the planet, and that we can go a little bit lighter, easier on our non-human neighbors, give them space to breathe, give them space to be. Um, and with that, I just want to sort of leave you with a vision of what community science is. When I picture it, I don't picture science. I don't picture analysis. I certainly don't picture computers. I picture this, people together in the woods, seeing and basking in the senses, in their own senses, and in the beauty of the organisms around them. All right. I hope you stuck with me through that. I know it's philosophical, and I hope that it wasn't um, totally unwelcome. I know some of you are probably just more eager to hear about mushroom biodiversity and mushroomification, which you'll get from Gordon and from Brian and the rest of the speakers this weekend. Um, but thanks for, for hanging in there through this with me. And um, I don't know if there's time for questions, but that's my talk for the day. Thank you so much, Christian. That was fantastic. Um, I'd just like to go first and say I completely agree with your um, assessment of iNaturals helping us to see both smaller and larger. Um, I know over the years that I've used it, it's been amazingly helpful for me um, to see both on the microscopic and the landscape level. And I really appreciate your take on uh, community to kind of combat ecological despair. I think that's something that probably almost everyone that's watching today um, suffers from in some way. And uh, that was a really great take on it. Um, community as uh, sort of ecological therapy. Um, so folks, if you're watching and you have questions for Christian, now is the time to enter them into the comments. I'm going to start reading uh, some of the questions that have already been entered, but uh, if you have more questions, shoot them out there. So let's see here. Um, Epic Mushroom Hunter says, very interesting. When is the first record of Squamanita species? First record ever of that one in particular? Um, I think they were known from Europe first, that particular species starting in the 70s and 80s. So there was a big gap in between the last observation of that species and the one that, that Ryan found. All right. Someone um, linked um, uh, Alison Pollock's Instagram account, which is Marin underscore mushrooms. Definitely follow her there. Yeah. If we, uh, if we actually have time for a break today, I have a slideshow of Alison's photos that is just fantastic. So maybe the viewers will get to see that in a little bit if we can stop talking, which is probably I not going to happen. I did get information that's a good fact check on something I said. Um, Gordon Walker, who's going to be speaking later today, said that Saccharomyces uh, lifespan is actually closer to one to two months. So much longer than I said. Uh, I think I said hours or days, which is my impression, but I was wrong about that. So noted. And um, it still serves to anchor the low end of the temporal spectrum. Um, they're short lived, you know, uh, uh, certainly much shorter than <clears throat> most of the sort of the, the perennial plants that we, we see something more like a wildflower that may only be an annual that grows up and dies away within a single spring season. Yeah, he went on to say the doubling time is four hours under prime conditions. So there we it's go. A pretty, pretty quick reproductive turnaround. Uh, Krista, the fungal forager says, I agree with your ideas around sharing the beauty and novelty of our finds. I do this in many mushroom groups on Facebook, but I worry about sharing specific locations of edible mushrooms on INET, particularly in an urban area. 
because places do get overrun. I do want to share knowledge, though, how to balance that. I'll I'll answer that first and say I never uh, put an edible mushroom on iNaturalist or definitely not without obscured coordinates. But Christian, what's your take on this? Yeah, no, I think this actually gets the heart of uh, it's like a micro question that reflects a macro problem where hmm. iNaturalist is, is not does not come without consequences. There are negative outcomes simply in knowing more, you can't really gain knowledge without also being able to exploit that knowledge for purposes that are going to hurt the environment, um, including something as simple as saying, I found a king bullied on this day in this place. You, Because of the scale of human communication, both in the speed of communication um, and the ways that we do it, there's sort of like this Instagramization of, um, of reveling in our finds that often drives people to follow on your tail. Um, almost as soon as you've been to a place, you can sort of funnel a bunch of attention to that place. Um, if you've said that it was great, you know, if you've sort of inspired people to go visit, they'll go visit. Um, you can almost count on the fact that someone will follow up on, on your recommendation these days. And that's a hard problem to solve. There are, like Trent said, ways of obscuring the coordinates of where you found something. Definitely make good use of that. But I think there's also a lot to be said simply for not sharing it. You don't have to document everything you see. And this is almost like antithetical to uh, science is sometimes you can, but you shouldn't. Um, that is a, a lesson that we seem to have a very hard time learning as a civilization. Not everything you can do, should you do. Um, so I think it's entirely appropriate to say, I'm just not uploading any edible mushrooms to iNaturalist. Sorry, uh, that's totally fine. Now. I could argue against that in a lot of other ways, but um, that's sort of a deeper, bigger conversation that we'd have to have some other time. Um, I'll take the opportunity to quote our friend Kenichi, who was one of the creators of iNaturalist. Um, I was talking with him about this same dilemma quite a few years ago, and he said, you know, you don't have to upload everything. Um, maybe just go home and shout the GPS coordinates into your pillow instead. <laughs> <laughs> I did that one. I think I've done that a few times. Um, let's see. We've got a question here from uh, Dr. Puma who says, fantastic talk. Do you have any advice on how we balance share? Oh, this is kind of the same question. Do you have any advice on how we balance sharing potentially sensitive species and potentially loving them to death and being gatekeepers? Um, I have ideas. I don't have solutions. Um, this is these are the sort of tasks that fall to us as the next generation of community science engagers. We all, you know, I think all of us in this talk, whether we're at the meta level, I sort of feel like a middle ground person myself between people who are brand new to natural history and people who are academics. I am neither of those. Um, whether you're at my level, whether you're totally just starting out or whether you're an academic, we're all going to have to sort of work together to solve these kinds of questions. What is the the needle that needs to be threaded with regards to like, can can the world survive our attention to it? Can the world survive our interest in it? Um, I don't think it's clear that tide pools can necessarily. Um, I've heard a lot from people who are long term tide pool enthusiasts in California that since this like large uh, surge of interest in tide pools in the past five or 10 years, there has been a decline in the health of the tide pools that people who are using iNaturalist are visiting. Okay, so that's super uncomfortable. That is not the most reassuring thing to hear, but it's true. And if it's true, you kind of just have to accept that and, and move forward with that knowledge and say, okay, how are we going to let these organisms survive our desire to see them? Is it as important for you to see them as it is for the organism to be alive? I think the answer should be clearly no. It's more important for these ecosystems to be intact and healthy than for you to go out and get all the cool pictures you want. And this is something I have to tell myself. It's very hard for me to dial back on my own desire here. Um, and I don't think I've, I've negotiated that tension perfectly in my own life. And I look forward to sort of the community around me getting better at, um, at sort of strengthening that resolve to let the organisms take priority over our own desire. Um, we're all going to have to work on that. This this set of questions is only going to grow in importance in the coming years. Agreed. Um, and, you know, this is probably a, 
a topic that I'm going to cover with my next guest, Dr. Gordon Walker, uh, but th this is something that social media platforms in general, or especially ecologists and conservation-minded folks on social media platforms outside of iNaturalist are also struggling with, which is um, how do you follow best practices um, when you're sharing things with the entire world? Uh, you know, Leave No Trace, which was kind of the, the definitive organization that developed wilderness ethics back in the day, now has a, an entirely new set of guidelines that hmm. they apply to social media platforms. Oh, um, man, you know, I need to look those up. Can you link them real quickly by any chance or is it too hard to find? I can uh, I can throw that in there maybe during our break. I yeah. would love to see those. Yeah. I'm sure I can find them myself. I can Google. <laughs> uh, we've got one more question here. Um, Phoebe over on Facebook asks... Does the phone get in the way of the experience? Yeah, that's a, another classic question is, does the phone, I mean, it's sort of physically in between you and the organism. Like just if you stop and look at what's happening when you take a picture of an organism, the organism's there, the phone's here and you're on this side. So in some ways, yes, it is between you and the organism. And it can, I think, diminish or deteriorate your experience of it. And that's another thing that I think falls to the community to develop cool cultural practices about because it's not objective there's nothing saying from outside that it's worse to have a screen mediated experience of an organism but i think we all kind of feel it um that there's at some point a desire we have to put the phone away and just bask in the organism slowly and not move on from it immediately once you've taken the photo is to stop and observe it and sit with it and see what it's doing um long after your interest in documenting it has faded. Um, that said, I will argue the other side as well. There are many organisms I would not have paid attention to unless I had had a tool to help visualize them. Um, there's many springtails you have no hope of seeing with your eyes because you're too big. Humans are at the wrong scale to really get in a springtails world, but a hand lens or a TG5, one of those super macro cameras, will help you see what they're doing. Someone posted a video recently, um, I think it was uh, an, uh, someone I hope to meet soon, Stu Pickell, um, who posted a, a photo of a bite out of a cup fungus that a Springdale had just taken. Wow. You could actually see where its mouth parts had taken a chunk out of the mushroom. And that is not something you could ever see with your own eyes. So in some senses, the devices allow you to expand your scope downwards. And so in that sense, I recommend them. They're augmentations of your senses, but being able to be self-aware and have priorities about balancing um, how much the device gets in the way of sensing and how much it augments the sensing is something obviously we're going to have to be in tension with for a long time and figure out how to do that uh, productively and sort of in a way that's sort of spiritually gratifying. Yeah, I'll I'll echo your those same thoughts and say that as as a photographer, I often find myself, um, yeah, snapping the photo or you know snapping a hundred photos and then immediately moving on. And right. it, it takes a lot of uh, practice and discipline to mm -hmm. remember to put the camera down and, yep. like you said, just sit with the organism for a little while or the place and and be there and try to remember what it was like before right. we had all of this amazing digital technology at our disposal when you know we just went out into the woods and sat and stared at things and maybe wrote in a notebook. But uh, you know what's a, an easy way to do it is if you make it routine. If you say, I am going out, literally leaving my camera at home, there's no way to pull the camera out. And you can right. just make that part of your natural history practice. And it's something I've thought about you know, there are years where I feel like, okay, I want to make as many iNaturalist observations as possible this year. And I think my challenge for next year might be to make as few as possible um, <laughs> and simply change the way that I interact with nature for a whole year and just say, okay, I'm not doing any of this this year. What am I going to do instead? Am I going to paint about it? Am I going to write songs about it? Am I going to write longhand the old way in a notebook about it? Um, Am I going to follow one organism for the entire day and see what its routine is like? I mean, when was the last time someone followed a banana slug for 42 hours? You know, I want to try that sometime. <laughs> Just you can find the banana slug, and if you've got discipline and some preparation, you can literally follow it for as long as you care to. And I uh, want I, them to do that and tell me what happens. What I, I would. I would venture to say that's never been done and that you you might, uh, you know, have a sort of observational science first if you did that. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, for all the questions and comments. 
Christian, thanks so much for that presentation. It's always fantastic to hear your uh, mind at work and your take on these subjects. I'm hoping you'll stick around and help me uh, do a quick review of the Bay Area Myco Blitz. Is that okay? Oh, how, like right now? How do I do that? Do I? Um, I'm gonna. We're gonna take a quick break so okay. that uh, so that you and I can you know get a drink of water or whatever, and then we'll be right back. And I'll just do a screen share and uh, I'll take care of it on my end. All righty. So, all Thanks right, folks. Here today. Yeah. Um, stick around. We're going to take a very short break and we'll be right back in just a couple of minutes with a review of the 2022 Bay Area Myco Blitz. That's where you'll be able to see the most commonly observed mushrooms on iNaturalist of the past week. So we'll be right back. All right, everyone, welcome back to the 2022 Tilden Fungus Fair. Um, we're now going to review the results of the Bay Area Myco Blitz, a week-long event documenting the fruiting fungi of the greater Bay Area over on iNaturalist. I'll give you a little backstory of this event. Uh, this last year, 
when I decided to do the Fungus Fair virtually, I was trying to figure out a way how to let viewers have the experience of seeing what mushrooms are currently fruiting. Because in the past, and kind of the premise behind a fungus fair is that, uh, you know, there are piles of rotting mushrooms out on tables for people to look at and poke. So uh, a, iNaturalist is a fantastic tool to kind of replicate that experience, but in a virtual way, because we get a snapshot of what is currently fruiting uh, in and around the greater Bay Area. Of course, no one gets to poke them in person, but they're still here. So, um, Christian, here are the results. We had, uh, looks like 2,246 observations, 371 species, 484 people uh, took part in this BioBlitz. I'm sure a lot of them incidentally, because I, I set this up as a kind of an, a, a data aggregating project in which it just swept up all mushroom observations. But nevertheless, that's how many people went out and documented mushrooms in the past week in the Bay Area. That's good news. Let's see, 371 species. That's in the past week, you said? Yep. That's especially impressive given how dry it's gotten. Agreed. So and I was thinking... Uh, what's, what's left out there? Yeah, people people are scrounging, probably finding some, some wet corners of the Bay Area, you know, over in the coastal mountains or something. Uh, I was thinking we could just go over the top five sure. uh, most commonly observed fungi that were fruiting in the past week. And maybe this is a good time to uh, mention to our viewers the sort of built-in observer bias in iNaturalist. Do you want to address that, Christian? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the... Uh... If you look at these top five, this first row here, you can see this observer bias um, in a few different forms. The very first mushroom is showy and it's perennial. Or not perennial, but it's long lasting. It's actually more like an annual or biennial, but that means it stays there all year. So you can simply get more observations because it's more frequently available to observe. So that's clearly reflective of an observer bias. Although to be fair, it's also a really common mushroom. It's perhaps more um, expressly represented this observer bias phenomenon by this red mushroom over on the right side of the screen, Hygrosophy coccinea, because it's red. Um, it's really beautiful. It's really striking. It's nowhere near as common as the other four in that top row, generally speaking. What it means, though, is that it's uh, attractive for people to document. And it's also out right now. So it does accurately represent the fact that we are in the, in the middle of its prime season. These red waxy caps are, are fruiting in a, in a big way right now. Um, those middle three observations, um, Loradiomyces, the mulch maids, they are, I think the reason we're seeing them in the top five here is that they are around people. Their mm -hmm. main habitat is in mulch, gardens, roadside edges, um, landscaping on the highway even. I've seen fruitings of tens of thousands uh, along the side of the highway. So the reason we're seeing so many observations of those is because they are easier to get to from wherever humans are. So there's sort of a geographic correlation between where the observers are and where the organism is. Um, annual hypoxylon, cramp balls, those little charcoal briquettes with little pimples all over them. They're another one that's both objectively extremely common and B, they're, they last a long time. So the number of days you can make observations from, of them uh, doesn't fade so rapidly. Um, other mushrooms come up and they decay within seven or 10 days. These things last for months and months. So there's a little bit of a bias towards longer lasting fruit bodies in our records. Um, Pluteus exilis, that middle one, doesn't really fit any of the profiles I just talked about. So I think that's one that we can identify as legitimately common. Um, this is a mushroom that is represented here, not because it's close to people necessarily, not because it's super beautiful. It is kind of big but it's not bright red or really colorful or anything. It's just an extremely common mushroom. Right. Yeah. So, so all, all five of these, well, with maybe with the exception of the hygrosophy, relatively common and then hygrosophy illustrating uh, observer bias where we see something shiny and we want to take a picture of it, collect sure. it in a sense of documenting it. Well, let's dive into at least a couple of these in greater detail. Um, Let's talk about annulo hypoxylon for just a minute. So when I first started using iNaturalist a million years ago, uh, this this species was misidentified as Daldinia concentrica in mm. California. And we, we've since squared that away, but um, 
I think that's probably something that a lot of our viewers have experienced or maybe are experiencing as they go out into the field and identify, try to identify species and maybe are using um, older guidebooks with a little bit older taxonomy. Uh, I mean, I think the reason this was called Daldenia for so long is because it was listed in a guidebook as being present in California. And then we found out that wasn't the case, or at least it wasn't the case to the extent that we thought. If Daldenia is here, it's certainly not the most common species. It's Annulohypoxylon. That's exactly right. So um, both of these mushrooms that you're mentioning, Daldenia and Annulohypoxylon, are round, black, hard, dark stromata that grow on wood. They look very similar to a casual glance. Um, but they're actually pretty different once you start looking at them and, and know what to inspect. And the last thing you said is exactly right. Daldinia is present in California. It's just really hard to find bona fide Daldinia. They are here, um, but they are no, like orders of magnitude less common than the one that you see on the screen right now. Um, And, and the reason that we misidentified it for so long is just like you said, it was the first name that was available in the guidebooks that people learn from. And there's kind of a priority effect to the first name you encounter. If you learn the phenomenon in the world under one name, that's the name that sort of holds on the longest in your brain until you dislodge it with new understanding. And that's a problem that you know doesn't go away. We're always gonna have to do some of that as understanding changes. So it's not a big deal as long as we understand why those changes happen and we can communicate the change to each other. Right. Which uh, I think your Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast guidebook does a fantastic job of. And I'm going we'll to you know, I'm going to plug that again in a minute. But um, well, speaking of species and our idea of species, can we talk about Tremides versicolor? Mm. Um, this is a species that in theory is present all over North America. But is it really just one species or do you think we're looking at a species complex with this, this with this particular organism? This is a fantastic opportunity to show my ignorance. Um, <laughs> a, I think that Tremides versicolor is present across North America. I think it's an extremely widely distributed organism, probably even across other continents besides North America. Uh, I do think there is evidence to show that it's legitimately widely distributed, even on a global scale. However, I think there are more things that look like Tremides versicolor than are currently appreciated. Um, Trimides ocracia is one of them, it looks very, very similar. Um, but I think even beyond that, there's going to be some finer parsing of what we currently lump together under um, Trimides versicolor. Someone like Alan Rockefeller um, probably has a, a sort of finer understanding or closer, closer watch on the pulse of the genetics that have been coming in as sort of like amateurs. Um, non-professionals are adding their sequence data to iNaturalist. If you're watching all of that come in, you can start to get a sense of, okay, here's one genetic group that we're starting to see that is a little bit different from the main core of sequences that we're getting represented um, from organisms that look more or less like Tremides uh, versicolor. So it's, it's not easy to say. And it also, you know, depending on your priorities, it may not even matter. Um, if you're not terribly interested in knowing every species name and you're mostly interested in recognizing that kind of a thing, you can keep calling them by the common name turkey tails, um, probably as a, a substitute for that entire species complex forever. Because um, for some priorities, that's a good enough granularity of understanding that you don't need to learn every new name. Of course, if you're someone like me, you will probably want to. Unfortunately, that's what I'll waste my my <laughs> 90 years on this planet doing. <laughs> well, and I asked the question because I'm guilty of that too. Um, well, that's that's turkey tail. And uh, that, that seems to be, I'm not surprised that it's the most commonly observed species of the past week again, like you said, because it's, uh, because it's, um, it's not perennial, but it lasts well into the summer. It's relatively easy to find this time of year. It's very showy. And I find, uh, as a, as a park naturalist and a, you know, a frontline interpreter who interacts with the public almost every day, uh, people are really curious about turkey yeah. tail because they've heard somewhere online or read a study or something that it has medicinal properties. I was just about to say that we totally overlooked that that's the only one in that first lineup of five that has real common practical application in human uh, commerce. It's uh, a medicinal mushroom. So that's probably another major factor that plays into it being so commonly observed is that people have a background awareness of it that they don't have for those other mushrooms. You know, even non-specialists know the name turkey tail. Right. 
Right. Relatively common, well-known. Um, and of course, just to throw things off, I said we were just going to go over the top five, but here at number six is... Let's do the bottom five. False turkey <laughs> tail. most rarely observed. We could, we, could, we could do the bottom five. Um, false turkey tail coming in at number six, which um, I, you know, just personally, I kind of detest false anything as a common name because as, as it implies that there's, you know, a correct one and an incorrect one. I guess in the case of I turkey actually, tail, that works because one is, you know, turkey tail is medicinal and has beneficial uses to humans and sterium does not. Yeah. So <clears throat> while I agree with you, I think one solution would just be to use it more broadly and we could call Trimides versicolor the false, false turkey tail. <laughs> there you go. Add false another false problem to by it. doubling down on it. Um, so I'm going down to the bottom here and my, my, Results are loading a little slowly, probably because I'm streaming multiple 1080 no, video I'm feeds out. More observations right now. Yeah, probably. So here are the bottom observed observations. I, to be fair, the last 40 or so have only have one observation, but I just went to the very bottom of the list. Uh, Calibiopsis velocipes. That's an extremely common mushroom, but hard to find. So it's visually difficult to detect. And B, there's probably less of it out right now because it's so dry. It likes really wet conditions. Okay. Um, so that's my guess for why there's so few observations of it, even though it's common. Um, something I'm reacting to here and seeing these bottom five, though, is uh, Trimatostroma aerodictyon is not a name I've ever heard before. And I'm really curious what that is. Can you click on that observation? Sure. This I may this may be a, non, uh, a, a, a non-mushroom that made it through my filters. Oh, it's definitely a non-mushroom. It's going to be some sort of sooty mold growing on your basanta. But... The funny thing yep. is, I think I have a sprig of this sitting on my desk right now. Hmm. There I you go. So, so I'll, I'll show my own bi species biases. Uh, I, my viewers can accuse me of speciesism, but I set up filters when I do this Myco Blitz to try and focus on uh, large, fleshy Asco mycetes and Basidio mycetes. And do you, um, exclude here's... Not, do you exclude lichens? I do. Yeah, so I do that as well, and I don't think we have to be uh, too apologetic about it. Okay, um, that makes me feel better. <laughs> the reason I always tell people about why I set up uh, lichen excluding filters is that the way that we study fleshy fungi, fleshy macrofungi, is really different. Like the tools and techniques are very different, which is not to say that we need to exclude them, but it's the reason why I personally tend to set up my filters to exclude lichenized fungi. Um, I'm getting more ecumenical in my um in my focus a little more broad i have started to pay more attention to lichens but i think i will always continue to uh pursue them as different sort of um avenues of investigation you can study lichens all year because they're sort of thalli or more perennial whereas mushrooms tend to be this very seasonal pulse of attention um that it's a different methodology to study them Agreed. Yeah, kind of. Uh, uh, they fall under a slightly different category, and not to mention they're uh, often very difficult to identify, uh, even different. even to genus yeah. in the field, um, without um, you know a really strong hand lens and often some some chemicals, uh, it's true. potassium hydroxide and bleach. So we had a request over on Facebook. Please have Christian talk about Amanita muscaria in the third row. Oh, here it is. Everyone's favorite, I guess. I don't know. Um, what do you, what do you have to say about this species? There's so much to be said, but so little that hasn't already been said. Oh, agreed. Um, it's obviously the most famous mushroom in the world, probably, um, because it's so visually stunning. And it's unfortunate how, uh, you know, the uh, familiarity breeds contempt often like plays out in our own in our own attention. Sometimes I'm able to sort of break through the fact that I've seen this mushroom 10,000 times and realize what an incredibly beautiful thing it is. Um, but the only thing that really surprises me is how many of them came in to the, to the mycoblitz, given how late in the year it is. Um, oftentimes they have a big flush in November and December. Um, so we're almost at into February now and to still be finding them shows that the species is pretty ecologically flexible. If you look at that, um, phenology chart on iNaturalist, you'll see that February fruitings are very rare. Um, you know, you can see that it's peak fruiting in California is about October, um, at least when most observations come in. You have to remember, of course, there's geographic and observation bias wrapped up in this. Um, but the fact that we're getting close to February and we're finding any at all shows that there there is a little bit more flexibility in the species fruiting 
than some other species that can't do this at all. And they only fruit during one very narrow band of the year. Right. Well, and I, from my personal observation perspective, uh, that's a good thing that these species are flexible in their fruiting because uh, they're going to have to be. I mean, as most of our viewers probably know at this point, California's winters are changing from their historical norms. And we're kind of getting this uh, compressed rainfall cycle now that uh, you know, tends to fall in a much shorter time period. And so fungi that used to fruit over this sort of long time and create this predictable phenology that we could go out and find year after year are no longer doing that. They're sort of having to fruit when they have available moisture, which yep. apparently is is still now for, for Amanita muscaria. Yep. Awesome. Uh, Christian, thanks so much for, for presenting and for... Um, and for sticking around for that review. Yeah, thanks for having me here our, today. I, I know our viewers were uh, excited to hear from you. And I'm going to go ahead and plug your book. Uh, folks, if you don't have Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, you should buy it. Uh, it is the definitive guidebook for coastal California fungi. And uh, Christian, where can your viewers go to purchase it directly and not give Uncle Jeff a big cut? Uh, unfortunately, Uncle Jeff gives you a pretty, pretty nice discount. So I don't fault anyone. Oh who's tight in the pocketbook to go buy your mushrooms of the Redwood Coast from Amazon. It happens. Uh, and you can, you, the, the other place you can get it though is um, redwoodcoastmushrooms.org. That's the website associated with the book where you can see occasional updates when I have time to make them. But you can also find a link there to buy the book. And if you buy it there, I'll be the one who takes it to the post office. So um, that, that purchases it from the authors more directly. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, order it from the website, and you can get it mailed to you by the author himself. You'll force or, me to go uh, to one, the post one of the office. authors. I had other things to do today. <laughs> um, you can find a link to direct order that book in our uh, on our website, tildenfungusfair.com. Christian, thanks again. Yeah, Good thanks for you. having me. Look forward to the next few talks. Awesome. Um, Folks, we're going to roll right on into the next guest. Uh, we're running a little bit late, as expected. My next guest is a scientist and researcher, but you probably know him from social media. Dr. Gordon Walker holds a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from UC Davis, where his graduate research focused on wine microbiology, yeast physiology, and fermentation. After receiving his doctorate in 2016, he worked at Opus One Winery for two harvests, and continue to work alongside and support the wine industry as a postdoctorate scholar with Dr. Ron Runebaum at UC Davis. He's currently a board member for the Sonoma Mycological Association. He's passionate and prolific mushroom educator with hundreds of thousands of followers on his social media accounts at Fascinated by Fungi. Please welcome Dr. Gordon Walker. Hey, Gordon. Hey there. That's right. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I think I was a, I think I was a bit modest when I said hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. I actually just checked this morning, and you've got 1.1 million followers on TikTok and 337 thousand followers on Instagram. Um, I'm just curious, how did you become the go-to person on social media for mushrooms? I'm not entirely sure. I think the keys to my success have been consistency. Uh, trying to always make sure that education is at the, the forefront of what I'm doing along with the entertainment aspect um, because I think if you watch a lot of my content it's not necessarily forward as being educational what I try to do is I put things that trigger an emotional response from people so they click like and they share and they comment and they go oh my god what is this and uh, when that happens ideally you get people to stick around long enough that you might actually read the caption on a video or like google the name of the thing that they're thinking about um, so growing the account has been sort of a slow methodical process, but there's been some peaks uh, where I basically said yes to anyone who wanted to use my content, which is a big no-no if you want to make money off videos. Uh, I don't make any freaking money off this stuff, so I am, I'm mushroom rich, but money poor, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> and so I, you know, you'll see my stuff on BuzzFeed and Unilad and I don't know, however many content aggregators, and they make a whole bunch of money off ads. I make none. Um, but I've said yes to everyone, and so now I have a platform. Well, I mean, that's uh, that's more than a lot of folks can say out there, and it sounds like you're pretty passionate about um, about mushroom education. So, you know, good on you. Uh, that's <laughs> it's you're you're fighting the good fight. 
I, we are certainly at that forefront, the leading edge of um, mushroom misinformation and misconceptions and trying to kind of slowly teach the world to be a little less mycophobic. I guess that's my, that's part of my goal. So. Oh, yes, uh, that's, that's one of my goals too, really. And that's why I host this event every year. Um, but I also think we, we have it kind of easy in California because uh, I don't know, folks, folks seem to like mushrooms out here. They like the fungi. They do, they do. I yeah. Think, and yeah, compared to some places, we we have a, a more captive audience. But I mean, the, the other thing I've realized from doing a lot of social media stuff is how international mushrooms are. Because even though I have all those followers, about 50% of my followers on TikTok and about 50% of my followers on Instagram are not in the United States. So it's a tremendously diverse worldwide audience. And I notice that when I go do a live stream and someone's like, hey, I'm in Thailand having breakfast right now. I'm in Finland having, you know, some like I go on at two in the morning sometimes to clean mushrooms and I have like a full complement of people from other countries who are like in the middle of their day and they're just hanging out with me. So um, it is an amazing community building tool, kind of like Christian was talking about where you just, you can engage so many different people. Uh, and there's a lot of people who like, I don't share a common language with, but because there's mushrooms, they're interested. And I think that's cool. Oh, fascinating. The common language is fungi. Yes. Um, well, folks, I've invited Gordon on to do a review of Mushroom Field Guides with me. So uh, so let's get to it. And Gordon, if you're okay with this, I'm going to just show three on my side, and then sure. uh, I'll, I'll switch back over and let you show whichever ones uh, you've got queued up for us. I mean, I literally just grabbed most of the mushroom books in my house and said, I'm going to just put these on screen. I can't necessarily say that I like all of them, but I'm going to just put them out here. Like, yeah. <laughs> It's okay. Sometimes it's okay reviewing things you don't like too. Uh, so let's start with this one. All the rain promises and more. ATRP, as it's sometimes abbreviated. Uh, this was published by the legend David Aurora in 1991 by 10 Speed Press here in Berkeley. And I feel like I always want to open talking about this book by saying that's not David Aurora on the cover. Uh, this is like a common misconception out there in the world. Um, it's also, I can, I can tell you that photo was taken on a hillside in Santa Cruz, very close to the music center under an yep. oak tree that is no longer there, uh, sadly. But, I think I have been to the spot. It's on campus, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just up the hills, you know, towards the arts center. I, yep, yep. I walked past it frequently when it's in Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not David Aurora on the cover. That's David Aurora um, up mm -hmm. on a couple pages into the book. So that, there's there's misconception number one about this book. Um, I guess the reason I like this book and I still recommend it to people is probably because this was literally the book that I learned how to identify fungi with. Uh, mm -hmm. This was the first thing I could get my hands on when I moved to California. And, you know, it uh, it's small, it fits in your back pocket, it really encourages people to take it with them out into the field. And it has a pictorial key right there on the first page and also on the last page. Mm -hmm. And I know we were talking about this the other day, but I was classically trained in botany. And so I learned to use these taxonomic keys uh, quite a while ago. And so to have this kind of really simple pictorial key right at the beginning and then at the, at the end that take us to these groups of fungi, I find very helpful. But I guess that's not a thing that everyone uses. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea of keys, but my problem is I think when I first got into mushroom hunting, I was like, okay, I need to find a key. And so I tried using this book multiple occasions to ID stuff, and I'd go down the whole flow chart, and I'd end up with something that just didn't make any sense to what I was looking at. And so I'd look up, and like, oh, it must be in this family. I'd go look, and I'm like, these don't look anything like what I thought it was. And that's partially because there's sciencey words, there's, you know, descriptions of them, like adnate, the current, et cetera, like names for the gills. Um, and for me, I'm less of like a flowchart person and more of just like a visual fingerprint kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, so what I found more helpful rather than these dichotomous keys, which I find they, you know, still frankly cons confusing, um, is to just look at a lot of photos of mushrooms and then create kind of that fingerprint, like, all right, that one matches this thing. And like, if I look them up together, they, they seem like the same thing. But I mean, I, I appreciate because like there's different intelligence types and everyone's brains work differently. So like, I am going to be working on a mushroom book very soon that I'm hoping will not necessarily be a replacement, but maybe an update uh, and even broader spectrum that people can sort of key into with something kind of an intro book like this. And I will definitely include a dichotomous key. I may might make mine a little bit differently just because the way my brain works, but it's a fantastic resource. And this is still one of the best books out there. If you're going to own one mushroom book, it could still be this one. 
Um, there are some problematic like old names and information editability and et cetera in here. Uh, also, it's hyper regional to Northern California as opposed to <laughs> actually generally um, explicit. But uh, but it's a cool book and it's, it's still really really good. Yeah, agreed. Um, it's still still relevant today. It will still help you identify mushrooms that, like you said, you just may not get to a correct scientific name because, again, uh, a lot of a lot of things have changed in taxonomy since 1991. Uh, but the mushrooms yeah, themselves that grow in the state yeah. haven't changed, yeah. right? So we're we're we still see the same things that are pictured in this book. We just have different names for them. Yeah. So. I don't know. All the rain promises and more. There you go. If you're only going to buy one, maybe maybe make it that one. It's small. It's cheap. Um, it's still relevant today. It's a uh, But you know, if I, I was, was only going to have you're one, only, yeah, if you're only going to buy one, buy this one. <laughs> I think I, I think this is the one that uh, I would have if I only had to have one mushroom guidebook. And it's not just because Christian wrote it, although <laughs> that does help a lot. That is, um, that is a fact. Yeah, Mushrooms of the it's Redwood Coast. Press, by the way. It is, yes. Also yeah. 10 Speed Press here in Berkeley. Um, 10 Speed Press kind of cornering the market on mushroom field guides. That's who I'm going to be writing a book for. <laughs> nice. Um, written by our former guest, Christian Shores and Noah Siegel. This book has it, what are what are, in my opinion, the definitive sort of photos for fungi. If, if, if you could uh, distill a mushroom down to a single photo. Uh, Christian and Noah did an amazing job with the photography in this book. They took all of the photos themselves, which I, I am blown away by because there's, I don't know, there's over five, four or 500 species in this book. I'm not sure how many, but a lot. And in every single photo, they have sort of created a montage of individuals in the species so that you can see uh, the, the top of the cap, the gills, the stem, the substrate and the habitat and or associated plants. I mean, like this, this photo just kind of nails it uh, for Entoloma medianox. Coincidentally, I actually just randomly flipped open to this page, but uh, this is a species that Christian described. Uh, yeah. So new to you new species to North America. Yeah. And have you eaten uh, this species? Sorry? Have you eaten this species? Have I have not. Eaten? It's good. No. It is, is it? It's ambiguously tasty. Yeah, it smells like cucumber. You cook it up and it has like a fairly nice texture and flavor. Taste, you know, there's some mushrooms that you cook up and I'm like, mm, kind of a weird flavor. I think I'll put in some onions and add it to something else. But this is one that like straight up just fried in butter. Very nice. Interesting. Wow. Well, I'm learning things today too. I guess this is a good point to uh, remind folks that unfortunately mushroom collecting is not allowed in the East Bay Regional Park District. Uh, these folks right here um, say that you can't pick mushrooms in parks, but you can go out and look at them and you can photo document them. And there are lots of other places in California to collect uh, mushrooms, particularly the national forests. And there's a very small handful of California state parks that allow it, but I'll let folks research that on their own. Um, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. It is a fantastic book. It was it was published in 2016, and so the taxonomy is much more updated than All the Rain Promises and more, but there are still updates that happen every year. So if you are a person who is really into using the, the most current sort of idea of species and scientific names, um, you know, some of these are already going to be out of date because the book's five, six years old at this point. Uh, Christian does publish um, those corrections on his website. So uh, you know, there's also you... an app potentially linked to this book because this is, if not a field guide, in the sense that it's fairly big and fairly heavy. And although I've seen some versions of this that are pretty well worn, um, I think you've got a few dog ears and stuff in there, I'm sure too. But uh, you, I think you can get this on a phone, and if nothing else, you can always download the PDF um, on your phone and be carrying that resource with you. So. You you are right, and that reminds me that I bought the 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 ebook of it from Amazon a couple of years ago, and I. I have it on my phone and I just completely forget to yeah, ever use it because I'm, I'm, I'm old school and I just, I, I take my pictures and or collect my specimens and come back to the guidebook. Well, yeah, I usually wait till I get home and then I kind of haul this thing out. And, All right, what was this photo? And I flip through it. Right. Um, the, the one thing I'll say about this book as opposed to like, this book is, is good, but it's sort of, it, there's no real organizational structure to it necessarily. Mm -hmm. And this book is great in the sense that things are organized primarily by spore color. Uh, as you go through. And so that's one kind of overarching feature that you can count on as you go through the book. Because there's things that are together, may see unrelated, like chanterelles and amanitas, like very different kinds of mushrooms, but they both have white spores. Um, and so it goes through the spectrum of spores and then goes a little bit into some of the claboids and the, the kind of weird jellies and truffles and, you know, 
clubs and stuff like that in the back of the book. Um, so in that sense, I really like the organization uh, of the way that they thought about how to structure the, the um, order of the mushrooms in the book. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, I know I made a plug for uh, taxonomic keys and binomial keys at the beginning, but I also uh, kind of learned to identify fungi by their look and by pictures. And if you have that type of mind, this book is fantastic because you can, it's, 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 it's almost organized like a picture flip book, right? Mm -hmm. Like you go through and you just have all these beautiful color pictures that you can kind of, you know, get to your related, your related taxonomic group and be like, oh, it's in this group. Here we go. And then go through these amazing photos and find. And, they, and, uh, and every single mushroom has notes on the apology too, which is nice because I think a lot of the other mushroom books yeah. are just very descriptive. But it's not super helpful to be like, okay, this thing has a five to twenty centimeter cap. Like, I don't know what that friggin' means, but if I know that it occurs under a particular tree type, or you know, there's mushrooms that mentions in this book that they don't have photos of. They say, hey, there's an analogous mushroom that looks exactly like this, but it fruits under Doug for instead of pine, and it's probably this species. And so, if you're in the right habitat, you can read the note. And go, okay, it's probably you know the other species that's not pictured here. All yeah, uh, totally agree. This is also my go-to reference for. Um, for mushroom ecology notes, uh, like if I'm going to make a social media post or or lead a walk or something, I will use this book and go exactly to that section that you just mentioned, the ecology, so that I can shore up on uh, the relevant information for each species. I think my Instagram posts, when I do them, I pretty much, I start with Wikipedia, I go to Mushroom Expert with Michael Quo, I go to Mushrooms Redwood Coast, and then if I need another tidbit of information, I'll just try to search primary literature with a scientific name, and that's majority of what I put into the Instagram post is basically those three or four resources kind of like smushed together that I have read at two in the morning and somewhere else. Right. And of all of those, this is the only one that you can physically take with you in a paper form. So, you know, um, there's a, there's another uh, a plug for Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. So, uh, yeah, folks, if you're only going to buy one book and you want it to be a big book that you maybe use more at your house, um, make it this one. Again, there's a link to order it directly from Christian's website on our website, tildenfungusfair.com. Check that out. Order yourself a copy today if you don't have Also, it. an additional plug, I, and maybe Christian, the other person, speak to this, but I believe that Christian Noah and Thea Chesney are actually currently working on a book uh, aimed at the Sierra Mountains, not just the Redwood Coast. And I'm super excited to, to see that because I have just recently got into alpine hunting and understanding the uh, the mountain sort of California season, uh, but I'm still just woefully unequipped to understand all the different kinds of mountains that are out there. <laughs> well, and that's a perfect transition. This is the last book that I was going to share uh, because this is what we have that currently covers montane mushrooms in California. This is California Mushrooms, the Comprehensive Identification by Guide by Dr. Dennis Desjardins, Michael Wood, and Fred Stevens. Uh, this the legends of the California Bay Area mushrooms. They, they sure are, yeah. Uh, Dr. Desjardins, a professor over at uh, SF State, and uh, a lot of really awesome work comes out of his lab. Uh, this book was published in 2015 by Timber Press, which is up in Oregon, and they also pr uh, publish a lot of mushroom field guides. So it seems like there are certain publishers out there that really are geared towards being stoked on publishing mushroom field guides. But, uh, you know, here we have it. This is the biggest book. Uh, I think it's actually the biggest mushroom guidebook I have. It's a really heavy, like, textbook size this hardback. This is probably the only mushroom book that I have that I could physically hurt somebody with. <laughs> there you go. It doubles as a self-defense tool. Yeah, if you're in the woods and someone comes after you, California mushrooms. Right, right. Of course, if you're carrying this around with you, um, you know, you're probably pretty stout to begin with. Um, so this is this is kind of, I would say, in terms of the arrangement of this book, it's a little bit in between All the Rain Promises and uh, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast in that it has a fairly complicated and comprehensive taxonomic key somewhere here in the beginning that I can't find right now. And then it goes, yeah, so each section has this kind of more of a classic uh, binomial key like you would see in the Jepson manual, for example, if there are any plant people watching this. So you've got these couplets that then take you on to the next couplet and then that take you to a, a, a species description. And that's the kind of thing so, that I find completely useless. I, I like my eyes read that stuff and just slide right <laughs> over. I'm like, I need photos, uh, not just these like weird, you know, super hyper specific definitions of things that I don't know. Right. I'm sure you're not alone in that respect. Um, but it, it still does. It has, you know, pretty good um, species photos for for each species um they're 
you know, I, I, I will say they're not quite laid out as beautifully as Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, but they do either represent, um, you know, kind of the, the, the typical specimen or uh, in some cases they're going to be a little cluster here. And this book sort of sort of starts where Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast leaves off. Uh, this is very heavily biased towards Sierra Nevada fungi. And uh, I think that's in part because, well, these folks, uh, at least Dr. Desjardins, studies and publishes a lot about Sierra and fungi and teaches a course that I had the pleasure of taking a few years ago um, up at uh, SFSU's field campus. So this is kind of like, I feel like the these fellows got together and and put this book together and it's like the perfect textbook to go along with this Sierra and uh, mushroom course that Dr. Desjardins teaches. Yeah, I, I like this book. I mean, this is certainly one because it's so California. I mean, both of the books, the Mushrooms of the Coast and California Mushrooms are very good for us because they are hyper region to our state. And that's one of those things that you buy a more general book and like we can count on this to be mostly Northern California fungi because that's where it the is. But people in like Georgia might read this book and go, I don't see any of these mushrooms because it's not relevant to where they are. And so that's one of the big tips you can get is if you're gonna buy a mushroom guide, buy one that's regional to at least your state or area because um, it will help you find more of the relevant stuff. For sure, yeah. And I, I'll I'll admit these are all like these are all three very regional to California. Um, I don't have a great recommendation for um, what, what you could use as like a nationwide guidebook. And I think it's because of that reason. Um, when when people or publishers put out a guidebook that is nationwide, they tend to paint with a very broad brush that doesn't have a lot of detail to it. And so you you kind of almost have to, I guess, pick very charismatic species or species that you think are going to be representative of a huge group that has hundreds of species in it, and then you know sort of leave the rest out and leave it on the on the individual reader to to go to learn more. Uh, but I'm curious what you've got in your stack there, Gordon. You've got a bunch of books out there. Um, you have anything you want to talk about? Um, well, yeah, I mean you know the classics like the the David Aurora book, um, California mushrooms, the Mushrooms Wood Coast, those are, these are some of my sort of most frequently used ones, but um, there is another one that came out pretty recently that is good. Uh, I think this guy was the head of the, one of the Carolina Mycology Societies or something like that. Um, I found him on Instagram and he had like, you know, nine followers and like an art account. And I was like, bro, you're like a famous mycologist and you just published a really good book and they're dealing with mushrooms on Instagram. Good. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is, this is similar in that they picked a bunch of sort of charismatic mushrooms um, but they've got good photos, and it's you know it's a nice it's a nice layout. It talks a little bit about foraging, about uh, other stuff. I think my mom went ahead and bought like thirty of these or something like that, and gave them all her friends. Um, so this is a pretty good one: forage for mushrooms without dying. Uh, an absolute beginner's guide to identifying twenty-nine edible wild mushrooms. Frank Hyman is his name. Um, so that's a good one that that just came out. Uh, I like the without dying uh, add-on. Yeah. That's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, Always I mean, we know Alexis Nicole, Black Forager, she's, you know, happy snacking, don't die kind of thing. Um, good reminder to, you know, always be safe, try to, try to take the time and stuff. Um, this is a good one. I mean, this is Gary Linkoff's sort of like, you know, end of his life kind of thing. He wrote this book and he tries to do a really good job summarizing stuff and again, doing kind of a general thing. Uh, there's some interesting things in here about edibles and sort of the arc of a mushroom season and just like general kinds. But again, it's, Sometimes when you generalize so much, you lose uh, focus on deeper educational parts. And like my challenge in writing the book is trying to get something that is like as di as digestible as this one, as small as this one, as general as this one, but as like depth and full of scientific information as this one. And I don't know how the hell I'm going to do that in something that's like you know a small book. But that's that's my challenge over the next year. So I'll be figuring that out. Um, other books I love, uh, Entangled Life, Merlin Sheldrake, is a phenomenal read. He's a, he's a really incredible author. He's a PhD where he studied uh, microheterotrophs and he talks about his experience with research. He talks about speaking to other really amazing like fungal researchers, um, the brain power of mycelium and all sorts of cool allegories to other things. And he dives into some of the sort of misconceptions and helps people write their own thinking um, in terms of like, you know, mycelium is not like the internet of nature. It's a lot more nuanced and complex, but it is, as Merlin says, it's a good gateway concept to help understand what's going on. Um, there's another book I absolutely love. And unfortunately, I don't have it because I lent it out to my buddy, but it's Mycophilia by Eugenia Bone. So the two sort of introductory mushroom books I recommend people read are Entangled Life and Mycophilia. 
Um, those are great ones. Probably the best mushroom cookbook I've ever seen is this one, Mushroom Hunter's Kitchen by Chad Hyatt. Um, there's a lot of mushroom uh, cookbooks out there, and there's some other good ones that I have. But this is the one that, you know, it's specific to the mushrooms here we have in California. But he has cool recipes that are not just like, hey, make a risotto with mushrooms. It's like he goes a lot deeper than that uh, and has a lot more stuff. And a lot of what his, his cooking is based in um, Spanish Catalan stuff. So he has a lot of recipes towards geared towards tapas and cold salads and um, just sort of interesting things you wouldn't think to do, plus a bunch of like mushroom desserts. So this this book is phenomenal. And actually, probably my favorite thing I've made out of it is a um, cauliflower sporasis uh, carbonara, where you use the oh. noodles of, you know, the shards of sporasis as the noodle for a carbonara. And it is, it's simple and just absolutely phenomenal. Um, so oh, that is, is awesome. That is such an underrated edible mushroom, in my opinion. I love sporasis. Yeah. It's, and I think, yeah, of the polypores, it's like, it's top tier. And I'm just waiting until we figure out how to like cultivate that regularly. So I'm dying. I'm, 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 so. uh, this is another good one came out pretty recently. It's uh, Kristen and Trent Blizzard. And there are a couple up in Oregon that they make like morel maps every year. So if you really want to find morels, buy one of their maps. And they, they're, comp they're using like GIS to like cross, um, I think, recent fires with the right elevation and habitat and things like that. Uh, so if you want to score big on morels, invest in one of their maps and their cookbooks pretty good too. It's a community cookbook, so they've got a lot of recipes from uh, various people, including my friend Julie Schreiber. Uh, this is the Fantastic Fungi cookbook. Um, and while the Fantastic Fungi documentary is a hot mess, um, this cookbook is phenomenal because it was put together by Eugenia Bone, who is an amazing author and a great mushroom person and actually knows her shit. She doesn't just glorify psychedelics, which is what right. the, the movie does. Um, so this is a good one. I actually have a recipe in here, and that's part of how I started chatting with Eugenia and became friends with her, and then she hooked me up with her book agent. And so a lot of good things have come out of just sending the recipe in. Um, let's see, we have California Lichen Guide, and I know you guys are being kind of mean to lichens, uh, but when shit <laughs> hey. dries out, there's still lichens, so it's I, one final thing you can you know. I just want to go on record and say that I love lichens, yeah. and I don't necessarily consider them uh, part of the fungus fair, but I guess I should because they are fungi um, and they are beautiful and they're, they're something that you can go and go out and find year round. So, you know, I mean, uh, that maybe, being said, maybe... I've owned this book for like two years and I think I've cracked it maybe once or twice. So it's not like I spent a whole Same. lot of time thinking about lichens. I think about them when it's dry enough that I can't find anything else. And, you know. Right, right. But for for cool. us mycologically minded yeah. folks, there's something to go look at when it's really dry. Yeah, exactly. And one of the other things to realize is like, you know, lichens, like these little cup things, or that's kind of like the mushroom part of a lichen. So if you want to geek out on like spores and fruiting bodies and stuff like that, they, they have a lot of the same components you can think about, you know, on a smaller scale. Uh, I'm not going to mention, there's a California foraging guy, but I've heard a lot of people have gripes about this book. So I haven't done a whole lot with it. Um, this is a good one. This is just like a kid's book, Mushroom Fan Club. And, huh. you know, it's a really good starting sp space for people to learn about mushrooms and kind of anthropomorphize mushrooms in a fun way. So you want to teach your kids about mushrooms, <laughs> Mushroom Fan Club. Um, there's Fungi Magazine, so there's a publication mm -hmm. I subscribe to, I believe Britt Bunyard is the editor. Um, lots of good stories, uh, articles from community, there's usually, every year they do like a toxicology report, which is really interesting to hear about like, what are the mushrooms that have poisoned people the most? It's usually, I think, shiitake and oyster are the two that cause the most issues for people, um, and usually the answer is undercooking. Oh, uh, interesting. Here's another little pocket guide. This is like a National Audubon kind of thing. This is probably not super up to date with science names, but again, it's, you know, it's a flip book of colorful pictures and, you know, decent information. So you can get stuff like that. Uh, this one is super dense. And I've been trying to read this recently because I'm trying to get context for how to like get the most information dense stuff and then make it as digestible as possible. So Fifth Kingdom of Bryce Kendrick is a really amazing book with tons and tons of super detailed, um, pictures and illustrations and all sorts of stuff but warning it is incomprehensible even to someone who's phd and thinks about mycology all the time um and then yeah I, I i have a copy of the fifth kingdom and i'm i'm kind of in the same boat i've been trying to make my way through it for years and uh i don't know i find it it's it's a it's it can be a good reference book if you right. are able to find the information that you're looking for which you know like you said it's it's really heady uh well, and, and there's a and lot of good stuff in there yeah, he spends a lot of time talking about things that aren't even what I would classically define as fungi, um, like the umai seeds and some of the zygomite. These things that are like moving, modal, swimming, eating animal. They almost seem like an animal, except they have chitin and cellulose. <laughs> and like, 
well, it's not quite a fungi, it's not quite a plant, it's not quite an animal. I don't think it is, but right. Uh, and then lastly, I mean, I, there's more books I have around, but this is another good one. I saw this guy talk uh, at Far West Fungi um, last June, I guess, Christopher Hobbs. And I'm very skeptical of the use of medicinal mushrooms and specifically with regards to supplements. Um, but I think that this is a fairly well-reasoned guide. His information from what I saw from his talk was very much on the opinion of, if you're gonna take mushrooms for medicinal purposes, you need to consume the actual mushroom. You can't rely on mycelium and you can't rely on tinctures. Uh, and I like that because I was like, that is more in line jives with what I know about fungi and that primary benefits are usually the polysaccharides that you're getting out of mushroom, which don't extract very well into alcohol or water. So tinctures aren't useful. And if you look at polysaccharide content, it's much, much, much higher in uh, actual fruiting bodies as opposed to mycelium, which can be mostly, you know, substrate, rice, hay, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you are interested in medicinal mushrooms, this is probably the one to get. I would avoid anyone who's trying to sell you something, um, particularly supplements and people who sell supplements and then tell you that they turkey tail cures cancer. Stay away from that shit. It's disingenuous. Yeah. Uh, well, and if 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 folks want to, uh, you know, be be sold uh, dubious mushrooms, all you have to do is go on TikTok, which is completely inundated with mushroom spammers. But you know what? That's a whole other conversation. Um, we are running a little bit behind, but we did get uh, a question in here, and it was, can you repeat the title of the cookbook that Dr. Walker loved? So he mentioned it before, uh, the Fantastic Fungi Cookbook. Yeah, so that the link on that is, if you go to my website, fastenbyfungi.com, there's an FAQ tab where I have links to most of the books that I mentioned. Um, that book specifically is called The Mushroom Hunter's Kitchen by Chad Hyatt. And if you go to my website under the FAQ tab, you can find a link to that. Nice, nice. Uh, I've just linked your website into the uh, YouTube comments sections. Um, sorry, Facebook folks, it's a little bit harder for me to comment over there, but I'll get that shortly. Uh, Gordon, thank, thanks so much for doing this. Really pre appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having we, me. we haven't met in person yet, but... Yet. Uh, I was looking forward to it, and I was like ready to, you know, shake your hand and say, hi, how are you doing? We'll get there. Same, same. Well, maybe maybe we'll, maybe we'll we should meet up at some point and do a collaboration. Fun, man. We could always do a live stream together on TikTok as well, you know? So that would be fun, yeah. Have a beer and chat with people. So cool. That sounds, that sounds great. Me. Yeah. Uh, the next presentation. Everyone, if you don't already, go follow Dr. Gordon Walker on social media at Fascinated by Fungi. Uh, his videos are entertaining and informative, and he makes a lot of them. Uh, thanks again, Gordon. Thanks. Thanks. All right, everyone. Well, our last guest for the day is a local scientist right here in Berkeley. Dr. Monica Fisher is a postdoctoral researcher in Matt Traxler's lab at UC Berkeley, studying how fungi survive and thrive in the face of fire. Fungi are some of the first responders after fire has transformed the landscape, and Dr. Fisher uses a combination of fieldwork and laboratory experiments to better understand the important roles that fungi play during the early stages of post-fire system recovery. Monica, thanks for joining us. Hello. Thank you. Hi. It's good to be here. Uh, yeah. Um, I know a lot of folks out there are probably really curious about your research because a lot of us, myself included, are wondering exactly what's going to happen with fungi in California in our new fire regime. Oh, totally. That's a big, big part of what my talk's about. <laughs> Great. So perhaps I should just dive right in. Sure. I'm going to, folks, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Monica Fisher. All right. See if I did this right this time. Cool. And I actually re, yeah, beautiful. Okay. Um, let me see. So, okay. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here um, and tell everyone here about my adventures with fire and fungi over the past couple of years. Um, and I actually grew up in the South Bay. I've spent most of my life uh, living in the Bay Area. Um, and Putting together this talk, I was reflecting on the fact that um, historically, I haven't really thought too much about fire or wildfire was sort of this thing that happened far away sometimes and I never really thought too much about it um, until 2013 uh, when the Rim Fire happened and it got a ton of press. And I remember, um, so this happened in and around Yosemite. Um, and I remember the, the conversations at the time sort of being like, this was a huge fire. This was 
like kind of unprecedented. It burned through beloved Yosemite. Um, and this is maybe something that would only happen once every couple decades or every hundred years, um, partially thanks to fire suppression. Um, and it's interesting to reflect that since the Rim Fire, this has sort of become our new norm here in California, um, especially over the past five years. It's like something, a fire like the Rim Fire or multiple fires like the Rim Fire happen in California. Um, and yeah, just to sort of echo what Christian Schwartz was saying earlier, um, that being an ecologist these days can be really depressing and <laughs> working in post-fire ecosystems is very bittersweet. Um, and yeah, Christian, the way Christian Schwartz articulated that you know, community is ecological therapy, um, we sort of get, th there's two sides to this coin. There's beauty and resilience in the way these ecosystems recover, which is the point of my talk today. Um, but it comes after a really dark destructive force that is wildfire. Um, and it's, you know, my heart aches for all the things that are lost, but then I also find a lot of hope um, in the rebirth afterwards. So um, on that note, I, my, my research story, I mean, at the time the rim, rim fire happened in 2013, this was my second year in grad school. Um, I wasn't working on fire related fungi at the time. Um, and little did I know that actually the research that I'm doing now would be rooted in the Rim Fire. And that's because one of my colleagues, um, Professor Tom Bruns here at Berkeley, um, he's been part of this long-term fungal biodiversity monitoring project um, that I think is global, it might be national, um, but two of the sites uh, are just outside of Yosemite on this map here. Um, in Stanislaus National Forest. And so they go out to these sites every couple of years just to sample who's there. Um, and then this is like an ecologist's dream. These sites burned in a natural wildfire in the Rim Fire. And so now they have all of these records pre-fire, fire comes through, and so then they can continue sampling post-fire and really understand how an ecosystem like the Sierra Pine Forest responds to fire and they have complementary pre-fire samples to compare with what they observe post-fire, um, which is really unprecedented. He got really lucky. Um, I think to my knowledge, Tom is the first researcher who had established field sites that a fire burned through um, and then it could go back and continue sampling and sort of use this a natural ecological phenomenon as an experimental treatment. Um, and interestingly, since then, this has happened to more researchers. And so there's this sort of accelerating field of um, post-fire soil microbial ecology, um, which is super, super exciting to be part of. Um, so these images on the right are what these sites looked like uh, soon after the fire in 2014. And then in 2019, I had the opportunity to go out with them to collect uh, more samples. This is Tom here. Um, and so this is what we call a whole stand replacing fire, where all the trees were completely killed. And six years later, there, there's only small seedlings intermingled with these shrubs here. Um, and I don't remember what my next slide is. Right, OK. <laughs> so Tom. Um, was thinking a lot about post-fire succession. Um, and this is something that I've gotten excited about also. So secondary succession is a really uh, a cornerstone of ecology. It's something you'd learn in any sort of ecology 101 class, um, which is the pattern, the sort of predictable pattern of how plant communities shift over time following uh, extreme fire disturbance and it sort of resets the whole ecosystem and there's this sort of predictable trajectory of you know you start out with smaller plants often nitrogen fix fixers and then this community evolves over time ultimately um, resembling the pre-fire community potentially um, and so Tom was wondering uh, it, do we see a similar succession with fungi um, and fungi might come up before fungi might grow faster than plants. Some, some fungi certainly grow faster than plants. And so, uh, like, you know, what are they doing in this time period 
before the plant community really starts to recover. Um, and this is what I've gotten really excited about. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> in, in this uh, cartoon, it doesn't look like there's much going on, but I'm gonna tell you there is. Um, all right, so when Tom went, Tom and his lab uh, went out to their sites uh, that were burned by the rim fire, they went out uh, every couple of months for about a year and a half, and they did observe this pretty clear succession of species coming up, um, specifically fruiting. Um, and so as soon as they were able to get into those sites, so basically immediately after the first big rain event, fire was out, they went into those sites. Um, they saw anthracobia just carpeting the forest floor, which if any of you have been out in recently burned wildfire areas, you've probably seen anthracobia, these little tiny orange cups just carpeting the area. It's pretty cool. Um, and then there's also this uh, more pink pyronema um, that in terms of fruiting bodies isn't, doesn't tend to be as abundant as anthracobia. Um, but when Tom's lab um, sampled the soil and sequenced all the DNA in the soil, about 60% of all the DNA that was in that early post-fire soil was pyronema, uh, which is pretty wild. Normally when you're sequencing DNA in soil, it's like maybe five to 10% is the most dominant organism. So pyronema is like crazy dominant in the rim fire soils right after this fire. Um, and then uh, a month or two or three later, whenever they went back, they, they saw um, our delicious morels, morcella, um, also some little cups, tricarina, um, geopixis is the stocked bonfire cup, lyophilum and crassisporium are two other basidiomycetes. Um, and then a little bit later, they started seeing foliota, pizza and coprinellus coming up. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these guys later. I'm just sort of giving you a preview now. Um, so this is what they, what Pyronema, Morcella, and Foliota looked like in the wild. And Tom and his lab brought all of these fruiting bodies back into the lab and got them into pure culture um, and got their genome sequenced. And so this is about where Tom, um, Tom's, yeah, excuse me, Tom stopped with uh, this line of research and sort of passed the torch to me. Um, and so this is a little bit of a preview for where I'm going later in my talk, where I'm gonna talk about how these organisms really thrive in post-fire environments. But before I get to the how, I first wanna introduce you to the who um, and who is surviving these fires. And yes, this is, a, this is a fungus fair. It wouldn't be a fungus fair without showing lots of pretty pictures. Um, so when I, I picked up this project in 2018, when I started my postdoc position here um, in Matt Traxler's lab, but also following up directly on this research from Tom Bruns's lab, it's a little bit of a collaboration. Um, and there was one, one sort of nagging question that really irked me. Um, I was just like eating away at the back of my head. Um, and that is that this is one fire. This is just the rim fire. Is this representative of all fires? Do the same fungi come up after all fires? Um, is this unique to pine forests? Is this unique to the Sierra Nevada? Like, was like, is is this incredible um, isolate collection along with genome sequences? Was this sort of a fluke or not? Um, and I so in 2018 I went on to iNaturalist and I I did some digging in the literature and I was really surprised to find that there was not a lot of information out there about post-fire fungi except for morels. <laughs> Everybody loves a morel um, but I wanted to know about the obscure little orange cups like pyronema and anthracobia and things that are coming up earlier um, and so I think there's a lot of good reasons for why there there wasn't a good record of post-fire fungi. Um, up until fairly recently, like in the past few years. Um, and a big part of that is that post-fire environments, like very recently burned post-fire environments are dangerous. There's a lot of standing dead trees that are gonna fall at any moment. Um, there can be things that are still burning a year later. Um, so there's certainly a danger factor to it, but um, also logistically. So Cal Fire is fantastic at closing off roads and really thoroughly blocking off wildfire burned areas um, until it's 
safe for you to go in. So it can be logistically complicated to get around those barriers if you're really determined to do so. Um, but there's a good safety reason why those barriers are up. Um, and also with our history of fire suppression, I feel like most wildfires, um, at least in recent history, going back like a decade or two or three, um, it's my impression that they've been sort of more out in the back country and like just not as as easily accessible um and so there just aren't as many records of it and also we didn't have iNaturalist <laughs> um so it's actually it's been really interesting uh that in 2018 I was searching for things like pyronema and anthracobia and geopixis on iNaturalist and there wasn't much or if there were observations it wasn't noted the environment that they're in so it's like oh, is this really a post-fire environment or not i don't know um and since 2018 and really since 2020 um the the fire fungi on i naturalist have exploded which i'm super stoked about um so right 2020 happened. <laughs> um, we can debate about whether or not 2020 is still happening. Um, but one thing, one of many things that happened in 2020 um, were some really mind boggling um, fires. So this is a, a graph that I made just from some publicly available data. Um, on the y-axis are the number of acres burned and on the x-axis is the year. And any fire that burned more than 100,000 acres I've highlighted has a red dot and the name of the fire, which is probably too small for you to see. But the point of this is 2020. Um, if you were in California in August of 2020, I know I will not soon forget the incredible um, lightning storm <laughs> that we had in August of 2020. Uh, and August is one of the driest months of the year. So dry lightning plus an incredibly dry entire California um, led to a truly mind boggling number of fires all across the state um, and an unprecedented, unprecedented number of acres that burned. Um, and while this was really heartbreaking at the time and my lungs literally ached from all the smoke that I was breathing in. Um, once the rains came and it was safe to go out and explore these burned areas, I found so much beauty and growth happening in those areas and it was really spectacular. Um, so this is a map uh, showing some of the burn scars from those 2020 fires. Um, and where I started to get excited is, well, actually, so this is the reason it's so heartbreaking uh, when the fires are burning. There's so many fires so close to where so many of my neighbors live. Um, but all of these areas in this, this purple circle here were also within about an hour, hour and a half driving. So that made it super easy for me to go out and check out what was happening post fire. Um, so I sort of picked three fires that I wanted to keep tabs on. Um, this is the Glass Fire up by Santa Rosa, the CZU Complex Fire down by Santa Cruz. And there's this little tiny uh, fire, well, relatively tiny compared to other fires on this map, um, east of Mount Diablo that got lumped in with the SCU Complex Fire. Um, and then also in 2020, uh, we were involved in some prescribed burns at the University of California's Blodgett Forest up in the Sierras. Um, and then I'm just showing where the rim fire was here for reference. Um, and part of the reason I was so excited to go out and observe the, the recovery in these, in these uh, ecosystems is because they're all very different ecosystems. Um, and I had this incredible opportunity to watch them all respond to fire all side by side in real time. Uh, so the glass fire burned through a like coastal bay laurel black oak forest. CZU complex fire burned through our beautiful lush redwood forests. Um, the area east of Mount Diablo that burned in the SCU complex fire is a lot of public kettle rangeland that's predominantly grass with scattered coast live oaks that gets really hot and dry for a lot of the year. And then we did our prescribed burns uh, in uh, a really typical, um, oh my goodness, Sierra Nevada pine forest. 
Um, and so these are some of my photos of what these areas looked like post fire. Um, and let's dive into who I found uh, just thriving here after the fire. Um, so around the end of January, beginning of February, I found these carpets of anthracobia um, in all of our wildfire burned areas. Um, interestingly, in our, so glass fire, CZU complex fire and SCU complex fire are all wildfire, very intense fire versus at Blodgett Forest, we did a prescribed burn, which is much lower intensity, generally speaking. Um, and I still saw some anthracobia fruiting here, but it wasn't the sort of widespread carpets of anthracobia like I saw at the wildfires. So I think there is some correlation between if you have a really intense fire, you're going to get a really intense fruiting of fungi afterwards. Um, so in addition to anthracobia, I also saw pyronema um, in all three of the wildfire sites. Uh, in the CZU complex fire, I didn't see pyronema with my eyeballs, but I did isolated off of this piece of totally burned wood, which was pretty cool. Um, and I, I did the same thing that Tom did after the rim fire is I've brought all of these back into the lab and got them into culture. So I have this like growing culture collection of post fair fungi that we can just play with from here on out. So about a month later in March uh, is when the basidiomycetes made their debut. Um, so we have Lyophyllum um, and some Foliotas. Um, and then we also have the Stocked Bonfire Cup, uh, Geopixis. Um, and a new one for me was this purple Pazyza, Pazyza violacea, um, which this is my photo. It really doesn't do it justice. I feel like it's just this incredible purple beacon of fabulous purpleness, purpleness <laughs> um, in, a, in a burned forest. Um, and some other possizes that just got gigantic that are pretty fun. Um, and like I mentioned, the SCU complex fire area that I went to is really hot and dry most of the year. So by March, it was like completely parched and dried out. And so I think what it's not so much about the month uh, here for when these fungi are fruiting. Fungi don't have a, a calendar that they're looking at. Um, but they are reacting to moisture. So I think it's really like the first rain moisture event that happens is when these post fire fungi start really coming up. Um, oh, right. OK, so <laughs> I'm about to dive into a little bit of data um, that is a lot on the next slide that comes from um, our research up at Blodgett Forest. And speaking of Pazyza, so um, I'll jump to the punchline first and then backtrack and tell you what this all means. Um, the punchline is that Pazyza violacea might function as a hub or keystone, keystone species in burned soil. And so this is a much better photo that really highlights the gorgeous purpleness of Pazyza violacea from Nick BG on iNaturalist. Um, you might also see it called Geocypha violacea. And I think Pazyza moseri might be an old name. Um, so this is a correlation network analysis. This is the result of sequencing DNA from the soil. Um, and then we identified all the organisms that were in those soil samples at our prescribed burn plots. And then we also had two plots that we burned and two that we didn't burn. Um, and then we sort of blindly put all of that data into this correlation network analysis and ask this statistical algorithm to identify um, correlations between organisms. And um, so Pazyza violacea was really highly correlated with, positively correlated with all the organisms in this cluster and very negatively correlated with the organisms in these other two clusters. And it has, it has a lot of these lines. It has a lot of, it's correlated with a lot of organisms. And so that's why it was identified as a potential hub. It's sort of a, like a community organizer maybe. Um, which I just, I love having that in my head for the next time I see it in the forest. I can be like, good job, good job being a, a community organizer, community coordinator. Um, this is all statistics though. It's not, it's correlation, not causation. So we don't know, we don't know what exactly possessive violation might be doing. Um, all right. So, right. The other thing that this analysis illuminated was um, these two distinct groups of taxa that we pretty much only observed in our control plots that we didn't burn versus 
this cluster down here that was predominantly taxa, taxa that we observed only in our burned plots and not in our control plots. So we're thinking that this bottom left cluster is all of our fire responsive taxa. Um, and as sort of a, a sanity check, I went looking for um, our, our known pyrophiles, I call them my, my pyrophilus friends, and indeed uh, Lyophilum atratum, Geopixis, Pyronema domesticum, and Anthrocobia all fall into this um, fire responsive cluster. So this is currently unpublished. We're working on writing this up right now. And part of what I'm doing is diving deeper into this really complicated network to see who else is here in this fire responsive cluster. Um, see if we can identify some, some new things that we might not have otherwise thought were fire responsive and what does that mean? All right, so I'm gonna go back to the pretty photos of fungi that we've that I've found exploring burned ecosystems. So I did my PhD on neurospora, um, not uh, in terms not in the context of, of fire or burned environments. My PhD was on on fungal genetics and cell to cell communication. Um, but Neurospora is a post fire fungus. Um, and so I have a fondness for canidial ascomycetes. Um, in the CZU burn area in particular, I found a lot of canidial ascomycetes, um, especially trichoderma and cremellosporium. Um, and then these photos are from Sydney Glassman that she posted on Twitter, um, where I think she had a, some connection where she got into the SEMA dome. Um, right after it burned. And so it's, I've never, I have yet to see Neurospora in the wild, but Neurospora grows underneath um, the bark of completely burned dead trees. And so you have to peel back the bark um, in order to find Neurospora. And I think it fruits before any sort of rain happens. So I think it's, it's making use of any uh, remaining moisture in these dead trees. Um, and it doesn't seem to have a particular, it's not particular about its, its host. So these are Joshua trees. Um, John Taylor, who's another professor at UC Berkeley, has seen it uh, fruiting from um, magnolia shrubs. It's been documented on pine trees, on sugar cane. Um, so it's very agnostic about its plant, just so long as it's burned. Um, all right, and then last but not least, I have to shout out Christian Schwartz and his buddy David for bringing my attention to this hygrosabi, um, which Christian found fruiting in mass in the CZU burn area. Um, and then David shared with me his spot in the um, glass fire area um, where I got to see it fruiting abundantly. Um, seems like a very clear fire follower. Sometimes they have these really adorable soil hats that were quite charming. Um, and the last time I talked to Christian about this, it seemed like this was a new species to science um, that we don't, Christian wasn't sure what this species was, but maybe he can elaborate on that for us. I'm not the text, I'm not a taxonomist. Um, and then one more little orange cup, pulvanula. So for the love of tiny orange cups, I have learned so much about how to identify itty bitty orange cups in this past year. It's been quite delightful. Um, so anthrocobia is technically an eyelash cup. It has these really fine um, little dark brown or black hairs along its margin, whereas pulvanula has a completely smooth margin. And shout out to Alison Pollock who took this photo who was mentioned earlier. Um, and then in contrast to both, so pulvanula and anthrocobia, their fruiting bodies stay distinct, whereas Pyronema's fruiting bodies tend to fuse together into this sort of amorphous mat. Um, all right, so that is who has been surviving fire. Um, now let's get into a little bit of the how. So how do you survive the fire in the first place, much less thrive? Um, and some lots of organisms have adaptations to fire. Um, fire tends to select for a lot of stress response and heat resistance genes. Um, fungi also produce these little sort of potato-like structures called sclerotia, um, and it's just a dormant lump of hyphae um, that can, in some cases, remain dormant in the soil for decades, hundreds of years, and then germinate anew uh, when conditions are right. Um, and so fire could be a trigger for um, germination of 
um, fire responsive sclerotia, but I'm not sure if that's really been shown yet. Certainly some fungi like pyronema make sclerotia. Um, another adaptation to fire is thick-walled spores. Um, often thick-walled spores are also melanized. So melon protects um, from UV radiation and the thick walls can also protect from heat. Um, and there are certainly some fungi whose spores are triggered to germinate by fire. So for example, the, the fungus I worked on in my PhD, Neurospor crassa, um, its ascospores germinate in response to fire. And working with them in the lab, the way that we would germinate them is either by heating them to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, or we just plate them with a little bit of liquid smoke that we would buy at the grocery store, um, which is super cool. Um, so another way to survive fire is just to avoid it. And for a soil dwelling organism, I think this is a lot easier than it may seem at first glance. Um, and the reason for that is two main things. The first is that fire is really heterogeneous. So the way that fire moves across a landscape, um, fire behavior is, is, can be really erratic and difficult to predict. Um, wind patterns, humidity, weather patterns can influence the way a fire behaves, but also fire creates its own microclimate patterns and behavior. And so sometimes it can just jump over a small piece of soil seemingly for no reason. Um, but then that little piece of soil that it jumped over acts like a little refuge for the organisms that are there. Um, and so the other way to avoid fire is just to be deep enough in the soil. Heat rises and soil is also a remarkably insulative substance. So if you're deep enough, you might not even notice if fire happened. Uh, and speaking of that, this is my little anatomy of uh, post-fire soil. So at the soil surface, absolutely, it's going to get incredibly hot, easily above 300 degrees Celsius. Um, these are temperatures that are hot enough to catalyze the formation of these really complicated and fascinating um, polyaromatic uh, carbon compounds, which we call pyrolyzed organic material. This is also essentially just charcoal. Um, and as we move a little bit deeper into the soil, maybe around 70 to 90 degrees Celsius is where it's hot enough to um, kill any organism that's living there, but it's not hot enough to catalyze the formation of these really complex compounds. And then as we move deeper into the soil again, at some point, there's going to be little to no effect of heating. Um, and this can all happen within a relatively shallow distance. So I'm estimating about 5 to 15 centimeters, depending on how um, how, how intense and the, and the duration of the fire is, but what we've seen in our prescribed burn plots is this can all happen within like one to three centimeters. Like you really don't have to be that deep. <laughs> um, all right, so that's a bit about how fungi are able to survive. We know who they are. Now, how are they thriving? How are they doing it? Um, and I like to think about this question from the perspective of what are they eating? And so I think this, this necromass layer where it's just a bunch of dead, broken open organisms oozing all of their goodies out into the environment. This is an easy, um, an easy buffet to take advantage of essentially for an organism that, that survives. So maybe like this thick walled spore here can germinate and just immediately use this sugar that's sitting there. Um, whereas if you come, if organisms are coming into contact with these polyaromatic compounds, um, with all of these really complicated ring structures, these are much more difficult to consume. Um, but a lot of the fungi that we see fruiting, they're fruiting at the surface. surface. They're all up in all of this pyrolyzed organic material. So are they just avoiding it? Are they, um, do they have some mechanism for, um, for, for avoiding and dealing with the stress of living around this polyaromatic um, compounds, um, or are they actually able to metabolize it? Um, and so before I get into what the fungi are doing, I want to spend a minute to really elaborate on how complicated this stuff is for organisms like fungi to digest. So this is actually an oversimplification. 
Um, the, on the right here is a figure from a review paper where they're sort of synthesizing the, all the knowledge that's out there and trying to figure out what is the structure of charcoal. There's a whole field of science out there devoted to figuring out the chemical structure of charcoal because it's so complicated, we don't really know. <laughs> Um, and so each of these images are basically zooming in, starting on the left here with these two handfuls of some charcoal, um, and then zooming in with a scanning electron microscope. This is what it looks like super zoomed in. Um, zooming in with a transmission electron microscope, we can begin to see some of the, the chemical structure. So there are these regions of, of like very organized chemistry and sort of disorganized chemistry. And so these authors are extrapolating from this, that this structure might look something like that at a chemical, um, on a chemical level. So it's these very condensed aromatic ring structures. Uh, maybe this disorganized area looks a little bit more like this slightly more spaced out area. But um, I hope what you notice from all of this is that it's just tons and tons of these rings, these aromatic rings. Um, and these rings are, um, it's like one of the most energetically difficult bonds to break in chemistry. And so it's really energetically expensive for an organism to try to break down these bonds in order to eat this stuff. Um, <laughs> and for that reason, this stuff also exists in the environment for a long time. So this is another figure from the same paper um, where their prediction was basically like organisms can't metabolize charcoal. Um, and on the x-axis here is temperature. So as you increase in temperature, you're increasing the number of those ring structures that you have all stuck together. So maybe up here at like a thousand degrees or hotter is how you would get this super condensed um, chemical structure. Um, and so basically what they're saying is as you increase in temperature, you get more rings, it's more stable in the environment, and that must imply that organisms can't use it. Um, but a couple of years ago, when I was first starting on this research path, um, Azmarat Berhe, who's a phenomenal soil scientist and professor at UC Merced, um, put a little bug in my ear that she, she was like, yes, we, we see charcoal persisting in the environment for a long time, but it doesn't persist as long as we would expect if it was being degraded purely by geology and inorganic processes. So she believes that, that that is some evidence that there must be some sort of biological process contributing to the breakdown of charcoal in the environment. Um, so to get at this question of what are our post-fire fungi eating in order to in order to thrive in their post-fire environments? I went back to Tom's uh, collection of fungi and focused on pyronema, um, partially because it's it comes up like first right after a fire, so it's really in this barren landscape that is dominated by this pyrolyzed organic material. Um, when Tom sequenced the soil, Pyronema was like by far the most dominant organism. Um, and when I found Pyronema fruiting, it's usually fruiting like on the walls of where a stump completely burned out. So I think of that as being like the most intense location within a wildfire area. Um, and so if Pyronema can thrive in that, like it must be doing something, something interesting. Um, so initially I just wanted to know how is Pyronema reacting to pyrolyzed carbon? I'm not gonna make the assumption that it's eating it. I just wanna know how it's dealing with it because it's clearly living all up in it. Um, and so to answer that question, I used a, a particular isolate of Pyronema domesticum, which we have growing, it grows super well in the lab. Uh, which I love, <laughs> and we grew it on these four different conditions. So this is just nothing but water and auger, no carbon source, no nutrients other than water, which isn't really a nutrient. Um, and wildfire burn soil from Yosemite, and then we have some specific 750 degree C charcoal, and then we have a nice gorgeous buffet of sucrose and all the nutrients that Pyronema could possibly want. 
Um, so growing in the lab, pyronema just grows its vegetative hyphae. It doesn't fruit. Um, occasionally, I see it fruiting on the edges of the of water auger. Um, but so so what we did with this is we uh, harvested all the the hyphae off of these plates and sequenced the RNA. So we did an RNA seq experiment um, to ask what genes are being turned on in each of these conditions. Um, and what we noticed pretty quickly is that a lot of genes were being turned on in our charcoal condition. Um, and when we look at sort of the broad groups of, of genes and, and uh, on the y-axis is the number of, of each genes in each of these groups that are being turned on in each of these conditions. So in the um, blue are a bunch of genes that we think are involved in stress response. So not surprising living in a post-fire environment, living in pure charcoal is going to be a bit stressful. So it has, it has mechanisms for dealing with that stress. Uh, but the second thing that really jumped out to us from this data is that there are a lot of metabolism genes being turned on and transporters, which would be used to bring nutrients into the cell, um, and monooxygenases and reactive oxygen species protection, which would absolutely be required for trying to break down these, these really complicated aromatic compounds. Um, and so I'm just going to jump to the punchline and say that, yeah, when grown on charcoal, Pyronema domesticum strongly turned on all of the genes that would be required to metabolize charcoal. Um, and the way that we know that is from this, I know it's a complicated, busy metabolic map that I made over here on the right. Um, but basically, anywhere that you see a black box is one gene that was turned on very strongly um in our charcoal condition as compared to our controls which were water and sucrose um, and so we can sort of follow this map starting at the very top we have our pyom which is made up of these complicated aromatic um aromatic compounds um, and so there are a couple genes that have been previously well characterized as being the genes that catalyze the initial breakdown of these aromatic compounds. There are a lot of genes in this category that have not been thoroughly char characterized. Um, so that's exciting for some future research. Um, but once you do sort of the initial attack on these aromatic rings, we can now follow these black boxes all the way through to central metabolism. So this was some really exciting um, stuff that really suggested that pyronema is actually eating charcoal. Um, but big caveat here, because we have to remember that this was an RNA-seq experiment. Um, and so we have to ask the question, does it actually eat charcoal? What RNA-seq tells us is that these genes that are involved in this metabolic pathway are being transcribed into RNA. Um, but it doesn't tell us if that RNA is being translated into protein? Are those proteins functional? Are those proteins actually catalyzing the reactions that we think that they're catalyzing, turning this pyrolyzed organic material into simple sugars and CO2? So to answer that question, we put Pyronema on a plane, sent it over to our collaborators at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, specifically, this is Thea Whitman's lab. Um, where she built this incredible contraption uh, called the charcolator, and this is our source for our charcoal. Um, but she also has grown trees in a um, heavy carbon-13 labeled atmosphere. Um, so normally, like the CO2 that you're breathing out right now is C12, um, and C13 is a, a stable isotope that we can also use to track the movement of carbon through a system because um, C13 is not, not, not nearly as common <laughs> in the air. Um, so what she did is she made this, this C13 labeled charcoal and then fed it to uh, my Pyronema domesticum and then asked, do we see C13 labeled CO2 coming off of these cultures? Um, and they have a whole complicated experimental design to account for all possible ways that C13 might otherwise be escaping from the system so that we can be really confident that any C13 CO2 that we observe is coming from pyronema actually consuming this C13 labeled charcoal. 
Um, and so what we saw is, yeah, pyronema totally is eating charcoal, if it must. So the way that we know pyronema is eating the charcoal is from these black squares that are slowly increasing over time. So this is the, the increase in the C13 labeled CO2 over time after accounting for a whole bunch of different controls. So this is like, yeah, pyronema is, is metabolizing charcoal. Um, but there was a proportion, a pretty substantial proportion of the CO2 that was coming off of pyronema that was regular old C12 CO2. Um, and so these, these cultures were grown, this pyronema was grown on nothing but auger and this charcoal, the C13 labeled charcoal. Um, so there's no other carbon that we know of that pyronema is eating. Auger is not a pure substance. Augurose is the main, um, main the, the majority of what's in auger. Um, augurose is a sugar that comes from algae. Um, and as far as I know, no terrestrial fungi, including pyronema, um, possess the enzymes required for breaking down agarose. So we don't think that this is coming from the agarose itself, but there could be some very trace impurities um, present in the agar medium that pyronema is really incredible at scavenging. So um, yeah, pyronema is, is just like a tenacious <laughs> organism. It'll it can make do with whatever it is given. If it is pyrolyzed organic material, if it's some trace amount of carbon, um, and yeah, that that is my story. I'm I'm gonna leave you with this gorgeous image of pyronema um, that I found fruiting in an area burned by the campfire a few years ago, um, and post fire and I, and yeah, I just want to say that post fire fungi have been a big source of hope and inspiration for me. Um, these fungi are just beautiful and resilient and tenacious. And I think we can learn a lot from them about both how to just deal with difficult situations and, and it also gives us an opportunity to learn about some really cool fungal metabolism. Um, and so with that, I, I have to thank a whole lot of people for all this work um, and thank you guys for all showing up. Please come find me on social media. Um, so my, my PI is Matt Traxler um, and huge shout out to our Traxlab Pyro team, which um, contributed to a lot of the research I shared today. So that's Grace Stark, Hannah Savin, Neem Patel and Philip de Lormier. Um, also our collaborators over at U uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, and all of this really originated from Tom's plots burning and from Tom's brain. <laughs> um, and so a huge shout out to Tom. Um, and now we have more field sites in Blodgett Forest Research Station. Um, JGI sequenced our genomes, DOE gives us money. And with that, here's some geopixis. And I hope I have time for questions because I'm so excited to chat with you guys. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Monica. That was fascinating. It uh, it seems like you get to combine field work with lab work, which yes. must be pretty great. Yeah, it's the dream. <laughs> yeah, it looks looks like it. Um, yeah, folks, so it's time for question and answer with Dr. Monica Fisher. Now's your chance if you have a burning question about fire following fungi or really whatever, uh, type it into the chat box. Monica, I'm going to uh, read you a few of the questions that have come in while you were presenting. Great. Uh, Emerald asks, do you think fire helps to spread the spores of these fire resistant fungi? Oh man, that's a great question. So um, Lita Kobziar, I might be butchering her name, but she's a professor at, ooh, in Idaho. I forget, I think in Idaho. <laughs> um, she, so she studies pyroaerobiology um, and that's definitely something she's interested in. I'm fairly certain she has found um, lots of spores in wildfire smoke um i that's a great question i don't know it's really interesting that these fungi do kind of seem to be everywhere and they're just waiting for a fire to trigger their growth um 
so yeah Tom, Tom actually did a little experiment where he put mason jars out in the rim fire site to see what was blowing in um, and the things that were blowing in the things that were in the air were completely different from what was in the soil and what was responding to the fire um, but that's you know, interesting yeah I guess there are, there are probably so many uh, fungal spores in the air just all the time that uh, I guess if, if we lay people knew about them, it, uh, I don't know, it might be a little enlightening, might be a little scary, but uh, you know, whatever. Totally. Uh, more questions. Alex asks, are there ways we could potentially use introducing fungal spores to recently burned areas to help plants recolonize burn scars? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's a, an obvious application of this research but there's so many caveats and and um and horror stories of introducing organisms to ecosystems that i'm wary to do that <laughs> i think that if we're going to do that we need to have a it needs to be really rigorously tested and it we need a really good reason to be introducing any organism to any environment where that organism isn't already present because um, then we run the risk of of uh, of having a, an invasion an invasive species that's aggressive and like ecosystem destabilization but yeah i think that's a really interesting question <laughs> right the uh, the whole uh, introducing a new species to offset some uh previous thing it seems like a, a lesson that uh humanity has to learn over and over again almost every time we try it yeah yeah um let's see ant asks did you say liquid smoke caused germination in the lab yes hmm, interesting yeah like the cheap stuff you buy to put in your quick barbecue sauce oh i think that stuff tastes so bad but i guess uh i guess the fire following fungi don't mind it yeah feed it to neurospora <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see a couple more questions here. Brianna asks, I wonder whether different fire succession mushrooms result from different temperature fires. If we more regularly perform controlled burns, would the mushrooms change? Hmm. Yeah, that's also a great question, but that, I mean, that's what I saw, uh, in 2021 when I was going around to all these wildfires. And then we also had our prescribed burn, um, that I had for comparison. And I saw the same fungi coming up after our prescribed burn as the wildfires so i think it's the same there are a lot of the same fungi it'd be interesting to know what the differences are for sure interesting mm -hmm. um and i have a question for you that's uh maybe a little bit of a softball uh as someone who's always been a hobby mycologist i'm just curious what inspired you to get a phd and now do postdoctoral work on fungi yeah totally so i uh, I was a bit of a latecomer to science. I was not a fan of school or academia uh, as a youth. <laughs> um, and I went to culinary school after high school and um, ended up working at this incredible farm to table restaurant uh, outside of Seattle called the Herb Farm. Um, and that's really where I fell in love with fungi. So the farmers there taught me all about the importance of mycorrhizal fungi. They basically put it as like plants are, wimp, are wimps. It's all about the soil microbiome and really the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and living in the Pacific Northwest, I just fell in love with mushroom hunting and, and got bit by the fungal bug. And mm -hmm. um, I, I just got obsessed with this question of how do fungi communicate with each other? How do they communicate with their plant hosts if they're mycorrhizal? Like, how do they interpret their environment and respond to it? Um, and I realized really quickly, I just had way too many questions to be working in kitchens and eventually made my way back to <laughs> academia and went to University of Washington and then came to Berkeley where at the time, that I joined Berkeley for grad school, we had three phenomenal mycologists. I did my PhD with Louise Glass, studying fungal mm -hmm. communication in Neurospora Classa, and then Tom and John, Tom Bruns and John Taylor were just down the hall um, as incredible fungal mentors and inspiration. So that's that's my story. <laughs> nice, that, that is a, a, a unique experience as uh, one of our YouTube commenters has just mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got one more question for you. Epic Mushroom Hunter asks, what do you think about community science as mentioned by Christian, specifically the relationship between the academic research versus observations on iNaturalist? 
Uh, I love it. I mean, I <laughs> I also loved Christian's reframing of it as community science and not citizen science. Um, and I've I've actually been ref reflecting a lot late lately on the reason that I have continued in academia and as an academic is because of mycologists. Like mycologists are just the most wonderful humans. Like we have this incredible community that I feel like isn't insular. Like we're, I, I hope, I fe my feeling is that academic mycologists aren't so much in their ivory towers disconnected from the rest of society. Like mycologists tend to have a genuine love of their st study organisms, which are fungi which connects us back to the broader community and just everyone who has a genuine love for the beauty of the kingdom fungi. Um, and I think that's really precious and important and wonderful. And it's what keeps me going is all, is all of you that <laughs> share this love that I have for fungi and we can just geek out about it together. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. I, as, as a, uh, an amateur mycologist or even maybe just a mushroom enthusiast, I'd have to agree with you and say that of all of the groups of academics that I've worked with over the years, I think, um, the academic mycologist tends to be the most inclusive and accommodating and just really stoked to share their research and information, at, uh, with, you know, with lay, uh, with lay naturalists or lay mycologists and, and even like, you know, are, are excited to just go out into the field and look at, look at their study organisms. Um, I mean, honestly, like, so amateur mycologists, I like, I feel like you, a lot of the people who are here really are experts. And I was honestly a little, a little nervous and also excited to kind of compare notes with you guys, because I do <laughs> not get to go out <laughs> mushroom hunting as much as I would love to. And, um yeah i don't know if we have time but i'd also sort of love to hear if other people who've been out in uh post-fire environments have seen similar things like did what i share match with anybody else's experiences if you've been out in our, our recently burned areas um yeah well let us know in the comments folks uh dr monica asks have you seen the same things that she has seen uh, in her presentation. A couple more questions came in while we were chatting. Justin has a broad question. Uh, do fungi have any unique interactions with zombie fires that burn roots under the soil? Oh, yeah, zombie fires are so wild. So uh, I've never heard them called zombie fires, but I know exactly what you're talking Same. about. So where I, I mentioned that pyronema likes to grow on like the walls of a burnt out stump. It's not just the stump that burns out, but the entire root system can burn. Um, and so a couple of years ago, the Olympic National Park up in Washington burned for like one of the first times in a long time. It's a temperate rainforest. Um, but the way that it was burning was through the root systems, which is just like Whoa. kind of insidious. There's like fire underneath the soil. Um, but yeah, do fungi have unique interactions with those fires? That is a fantastic question that I love. Um, Pyronema definitely seems prefer to fruit in those pockets. I That is where I saw a lot of fungi fruiting. And I think part of that is also um, because the, like that structure of like a little, it's almost like a little underground cave. It kind of captures moisture also. So it's it's definitely all about moisture <laughs> as a bottom line for, for fungi fruiting. But, Interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got one more question here. Jennifer over on Facebook asks, uh, or says, in some of your photos I, of post-fire fungi, I noticed some moss. Do the fungi help the moss? Uh, yes, another great question. Uh, I don't know. That's been something I've been really curious about also. Um, there is one paper out there from um, Brian Matheny's lab in oh Tennessee, Appalachia. Great Smoky Mountains is where that uh, paper is based off of. Um, and the title of the paper is something great, like the body snatchers hypothesis, um, where they're hypothesizing that pyronema is actually an endophyte in uh, mosses. And oh, that interesting. maybe a lot of post-fire fungi are endophytic or like have some sort of symbiotic relationship with moss, because you do often see them sort of very intertwined fruiting and growing together. Um, Personally, I am skeptical of that hypothesis. I think it might just have more to do with moisture. 
um because moss also needs moisture to fruit uh, or fruit grow <laughs> right it might um, just be overlapping habitat requirements exactly um, for our for our audience can you just quickly uh tell them what an endophyte is yeah it is a uh organism growing inside of a plant so endo literally means inside of fight means plant and it could be bacteria it could be fungi um i suppose it could be any number of organisms, but it's just something that's growing symbiotically in a plant, usually in a non pathogenic way. So potentially mutualistic, potentially just commensal hanging out, not bothering anyone. Um, that's the hypothesis for how Neurospora ends up underneath tree bark is that it's just sort of a dormant commensalate endophyte in trees. And then it, it's like taking the opportunity of the death of the tree to fruit. Interesting. Always there waiting for the right opportunity. Yep. Um, Krista answered your question and says, yes, it absolutely tracks with what I've seen in Idaho wildfires, particularly the Pizza and Foliota. Cool. Yeah. And this yeah. is also what's great about iNaturalist is I've started seeing a lot more observations and I've been more diligent about going through iNaturalist and IDing things for people. Um, like, yeah, these are post-fire fungi. Cool. That's great to know that they're they're in this part of the world and they're they're in Australia and they're in the boreal forests in Canada. <laughs> right so. such a such an interesting tool that we all have uh at our at our disposal now really mm -hmm. great that it exists um well thanks so much to dr monica fisher for both researching our fire-filled world and presenting her research to us today um it was a pleasure monica thanks for joining us thank you this is so much fun awesome well folks that wraps up day one of the 2022 tilden fungus fair Thanks so much for watching, and remember, we'll be live again tomorrow on YouTube and Facebook starting at 11 a.m. Tomorrow, we'll hear from Dr. Brian Perry on bioluminescent fungi. I am really looking forward to that talk. We'll have a mushroom cooking demonstration by Morgan Evans, and graduate student James Morris is going to talk about his research right here in Tilden Park. I'm going to wind down today's show with more photography from Allison Pollock. You can follow her over on Instagram at Marin underscore mushrooms. Thanks so much, everyone, and I'll see you tomorrow.